On August 8, 1998, approximately 37 children from the Dutch village of High Bloom embarked on an exciting summer camp adventure at De Heikoop, a recreational resort nestled in the Brunssummerhede Nature Reserve. What initially promised to be a joyous experience took a tragic turn, as, under the veil of darkness, one of the campers vanished from their tent, transforming every parent's worst fear into a heartbreaking reality. The subsequent day brought the grim discovery of the missing boy's lifeless body in the woods, a victim of a heinous crime committed by a yet unknown assailant. At the age of 11, Nicky Verstappen was characterised by his family and friends as an avid sports enthusiast, displaying a particular passion for football and mountain biking. When not actively engaged outdoors or playing with friends, he found solace in watching his beloved football team Ajax on television, rarely ever missing a match. Nicky resided in the quaint southern Dutch village of Highbloom in the Limburg province with his parents, Petia and Bertie, his sister Femke and the family's golden retriever. The Verstappens were widely recognised as a tight-knit family unit. Despite the close bond, Nicky, uncertain about leaving for summer camp in 1998, harboured concerns about potential homesickness. His apprehensions, particularly missing his family and the family dog during his time away, were shared with his mother. In response, she offered reassurance, affirming that he would undoubtedly have a fantastic experience at camp alongside his best friend, who would also be in attendance. Despite his friend backing out of the camp at last minute, Nicky made the decision to proceed with attending. Upon reaching the campsite, the attendees were organised into smaller groups. Nicky found himself sharing a tent with four other boys, aged between 8 and 12, all of whom he was familiar with. The first day at camp was filled with team-building exercises, games, and an evening spent around the campfire exchanging ghost stories. Around 10pm, as the camp counsellors and leaders deemed it time to call it a night, the children dispersed to their respective tents for a well-deserved rest. The camp leaders stayed up a while longer until around midnight before heading to sleep. In the early hours of August 10th, at approximately 5am, one of the boys who shared Verstappen's tent awoke needing to use the bathroom. At this time, all five boys were fast asleep in their sleeping bags. However, an hour later, at around 6am, another boy got up to use the facilities and noticed that 11-year-old Nicky was gone. At 8am, the children were summoned for breakfast. However, expressing worry about Nicky's safety, the boys informed the camp leader that they hadn't seen him since around 5am. A thorough search of the campground and the nearby woods yielded no clues regarding Nicky's whereabouts, intensifying concerns for his well-being. Initially, camp leaders suspected that Nicky had wandered off independently, but the truth proved to be far more disturbing. They contacted Verstappen's parents and alerted them of the situation. However, Nicky's mother knew that her son wouldn't have gone off on his own. She knew in her gut that something was deeply wrong. Upon arriving at the campsite, which was approximately a 45-minute drive from their home, Petia and Bertie Verstappen inspected Nicky's tent and immediately noticed something jarring. Their son's shoes were still sitting in the tent, and if he had walked off into the woods, why did he not put his shoes on? They searched the vicinity for their son alongside the camp leaders and counsellors, calling out for Nicky, but to no avail. After failing to locate the 11-year-old, at approximately midday, Dutch authorities were notified of Nicky's disappearance. 
Upon police arrival at the camp, a comprehensive search of the area ensued, involving camp personnel, local volunteers from nearby towns, and door-to-door -door inquiries with residents to inquire if anyone had seen Nikki. Despite these concerted efforts, the search, which was conducted during one of the hottest days of that summer, proved fruitless once again. Despite the Verstappen's evident distress, the police did not seem to share the same level of concern. At this juncture, they were convinced that Nikki had simply wandered off and become lost. As nightfall approached, the search efforts were expanded with the involvement of armed forces, aerial teams and search dogs. However, with nearly 24 hours having passed without locating the schoolboy, camp leaders made the decision to abruptly end the remaining camp activities and sent the children home. The prolonged absence of Nikki raised heightened anxieties, as it prompted contemplation of potential harm befalling him. Even in the scenario of him being lost, concerns arose regarding a child's ability to endure alone in the wilderness. On August 11th, around 9pm, one of the searchers, who happened to be Nikki's uncle, made a grim discovery, finding his lifeless body beneath a pine tree in an area used for growing Christmas trees near Lontriaf, approximately 1.2 kilometres away from the camp. Nikki was found without a shirt, wearing only his Ajax football pyjama bottoms and a pair of blue underwear. Notably, the pyjama bottoms were inside out and back to front, suggesting that they had been removed and repositioned. Initial signs pointed to a head injury, though the exact cause of death was yet to be confirmed. The situation had evolved into a murder investigation. Some blood specks were observed on Nikki's pyjama bottoms, but testing at the time only explored one speck sample which matched Nikki's DNA. A notable detail at the scene was the cleanliness of Nikki's feet, indicating that he hadn't walked barefoot when leaving his tent. It was surmised that he had been placed in the pine grove by the perpetrator, suggesting that the abduction and subsequent crime likely occurred elsewhere. The post-mortem examination took place three days after Nikki's body was discovered. Unfortunately, the delay was attributed to the unavailability of mortuary pathologists in the vicinity, who were on vacation during that period, leading to a temporary lack of capacity to conduct the autopsy sooner. Compounding the distress, the complete autopsy was not disclosed until two months later, presumably due to the extended duration required for a comprehensive toxicology analysis. The finalised report revealed that Nicky had been administered drugs, and his body exhibited indications of sexual assault. Despite the efforts of two pathologists conducting the autopsies, neither could definitively determine the exact cause of Verstappen's death. Suffocation was deemed the most probable cause, yet insufficient evidence existed to establish it conclusively. One grim detail of the autopsy was the time of death estimation, which concluded that Nikki had been kept alive for at least eight hours prior to his death. Numerous questions surfaced in the wake of Nikki's autopsy report. One prominent query was how he could have disappeared and how had he been administered drugs while sleeping in a tent with four other boys. Some speculate that he may have been abducted, possibly while en route to the bathroom in the early hours of the morning. However, the lack of witnesses leaves this theory unconfirmed and shrouded in uncertainty. If he had screamed or called for help, why did nobody hear him? In terms of the evidence gathered by the police at the scene, forensics identified several items of significant interest. Among these were a beer bottle top, a cigarette butt and a tissue containing traces of semen, found about 100 yards away from where Nikki's body was found. Notably, the location where Verstappen's body was discovered had a nearby car park commonly used for sexual activities, so finding items of a sexual nature wouldn't typically raise suspicions. DNA samples were extracted from these three items, resulting in the creation of a male DNA profile. 
Crucially, it was established that the DNA did not match Nikki's profile, but possibly the perpetrator. Around 35 men, including the male camp leaders, gave police DNA swabs to compare to the DNA found at the scene, but no match was found. Police had initially turned towards camp councillors in regards to suspecting any involvement in Nicky's demise, as it was deemed unlikely that he would have left camp with a stranger. He was already apprehensive about leaving his family behind, and wasn't the kind of boy who would have left with someone he didn't know. All camp leaders were cooperative, and were ruled out of having been involved through DNA testing. One individual who raised suspicions among authorities was Jos Barton, the camp's founder and former school principal, aged 80 at the time. Jos had a prior conviction for child sexual abuse dating back to the 1950s, resulting in the loss of his job at the school. Despite this conviction, Jos was allowed to work with children again, and he subsequently found the summer camp and a football club. He admitted to being in the vicinity of Nikki's tent when the boy disappeared, stating that he was assisting another boy with a burn injury around 6am. Subsequently, Jos claimed to have driven from the camp to attend a friend's funeral in High Bloom. It was only later that day that he became aware of Nikki's disappearance. Police found Jos Barton's involvement in directing the search toward the area where Verstappen's body was found suspicious, particularly his emphasis on the existence of the car park. Additionally, his prior conviction for sexual abuse and a claim from a 15-year-old girl who believed Jos had assaulted her in her sleep at the same camp just weeks before Nikki's death raised concerns. Despite these suspicions, neither Jos nor any of the camp leaders were officially considered suspects in the investigation. Jos died in 2003. A reward of 25,000 Hjeldeers was announced by the Open Bar Ministry in Maastricht for information leading to the identification of the perpetrator. In 1999, this reward was doubled, thanks to funds raised by crime reporter Peter Rudolf de Vries, who subsequently became a spokesperson for the Verstappen family. They managed to raise the reward money for information to 500,000 Hjeldeers, with the help of anonymous donations from various business owners. Despite the significant amount of money being offered, nobody came forward with any information and the case subsequently went cold. The case was dissolved, but a new team of investigators and a set of fresh eyes took on the case following the millennium in a newly created task force. Various sex offenders and serial killers were considered as having been involved in the murder over the years. However, there was never any solid proof to indicate that any of them were involved. The Verstappa family bears the enduring weight of guilt for allowing Nikki to attend camp on that fateful day in August of 1998. Nikki Verstappa's funeral was held on August 15th in his hometown of High Bloom, with over 600 people in attendance to support his bereft family. An Ajax football flag was draped over his coffin. A memorial for Nicky was erected in his memory at the site where his body was found in 2001, attended by his grandparents and those affected by the tragedy. Nicky's mother lit a candle every morning for 20 years in her son's memory and with the hopes of finding answers. She never lost hope that justice would one day prevail. Bertie told news outlets that despite the case being stagnant and with the police seeming to lack any interest in pushing the case further, she was never going to give up searching for the truth. The crime created a deep division in their hometown, with many speculating on Jos Barton's involvement, while others dismissed this notion entirely. Nikki Verstappen's murder tore through High Bloom, leaving the community grappling with hurt and frustrations. Despite the divisions, beneath the collective pain, the shared desire for answers persisted among everyone affected by this tragic event. 
To quell the storm of speculation surrounding Yo Spartan, his body was exhumed in 2010 and DNA samples were collected for comparison with the DNA found at the crime scene. The results definitively ruled out Barton as a match, conclusively putting an end to any suspicions surrounding him. The Verstappens were left understandably frustrated at lack of any leads in the investigation, and to that end, much of the investigation was not conducted to a high standard. Pieces of evidence were misplaced or not collected properly, including a cast of tyre tracks found near the scene which was lost. Police cordoned off the woods where Nicky's body was found, but not the camp itself, including the washrooms, which could have held some sort of evidence which could have aided in the investigation. In 2004, Peter de Vries requested a forensic re-examination of the blood specks found on Nicky's pyjamas, driven by the belief that advances in DNA technology could potentially yield new information. They discovered foreign male DNA on the pyjamas that did not belong to Verstappen, but this DNA did not match the semen found at the scene. In January of 2007, a 36-year-old man was arrested in Lontriaf following a string of letters which had been found on Verstappen's grave in the previous 18 months, which indicated he knew some significant information about the case. This turned out to be a cruel hoax, and the man was released. On Christmas Day of that same year, the man was arrested again for further letters and for vandalising the monument placed in memory of Verstappen. By 2019, he had vandalised the stone three times. He has been in and out of psychiatric facilities over the years. In 2018, the prosecution were afraid about the statute of limitations in the case expiring. Therefore, authorities announced a large-scale DNA kinship investigation, which saw over 21,000 men who lived in and around the area in 1998 having their DNA harvested for the police inquiry. During this DNA sweep, a -a one-of-a-kind process in the Netherlands, most men voluntarily gave samples to police. However, if they didn't respond to this request, officers would visit homes in order to convince them to give samples, given that it was a child murder case. Crucially, one of the DNA swabs revealed a familial match to the DNA found on Nicky Verstappen's pyjama bottoms, and this led police to that long-awaited breakthrough. The family granted police access to some personal belongings that belonged to the suspect, and finally, DNA was a match. Jos Brech, a bushcrafter and wild camper, was requested to provide a DNA sample, but multiple attempts to locate him were unsuccessful. According to his family, he had moved to France in February to pursue a survivalist lifestyle, and they reported him missing two months later when they lost contact with him. Living in Simpelveld, 22 kilometres away from the Brunsumerhede camp at the time of Nicky's murder, Breck was 35 years old. Police discovered his prior role as a camp leader and a disturbing incident in 1985 where he subjected two 10-year-old boys to sexual abuse, resulting in probation since he was not convicted. Due to the lack of a conviction, Breck's name did not appear on the sex offender's register during the initial search for potential suspects. Astonishingly, he was seen in the area at the time of the murder and stopped by police while riding a bicycle the night after, but was only questioned as a witness. Struggling to trace Breck, police appealed to the public on August 22, 2018. Just four days later, a Dutch tourist recognised him near Barcelona, Spain from media distributed photos. Brech was promptly arrested and extradited back to the Netherlands. Jos Brech faced trial beginning on September 28, 2020, where he entered a plea of not guilty to all charges against him. He claimed to have come across Nicky's body during a late night bike ride, but chose not to report it to the police due to his prior convictions. 
The prosecution pressed him on how his DNA ended up on Verstappen's underwear, a question to which Yoss did not provide a response. Additionally, a photo presented during the trial contradicted Yoss's claims, as it demonstrated that the location where Nikki's body was found would not have been visible from the path Yoss asserted to have taken during his bike ride. Jos Brech was found guilty of kidnapping and sexually assaulting Nikki, but acquitted of manslaughter due to the possibility that Brech accidentally caused his death while attempting to silence him during the attack. Murder charges were not pursued, as there was no evidence indicating premeditation. Breck received a 12-year prison sentence for the kidnapping and sexual abuse that resulted in the death of 11-year-old Nikki Verstappen. Additionally, he was given a further six months for possessing child pornography found on his laptop. In January 2022, a court of appeal convicted Brech of manslaughter, increasing his sentence to 16 years. In September 2023, an appeal launched by Brech's legal team was rejected by the Supreme Court, upholding his conviction. The harrowing case of Nikki Verstappen's abduction and murder unfolded over years, casting a long shadow over the High Bloom community and the Verstappen family. The initial shock and grief evolved into a prolonged quest for justice, marked by suspicions, investigations and legal proceedings. Despite setbacks, such as false leads and individuals initially considered suspects being ruled out, the persistence of Nikki's family, the public and law enforcement ultimately led to the identification and conviction of Jos Brech. His conviction, increased sentence on appeal and the rejection of further appeals brought some closure to the Verstappen family, although the scars of Nikki's tragic fate will forever endure. Jane Curia, a 46-year-old mother of three, was a devoted, hard-working and caring presence in the Powder Springs neighbourhood of Atlanta, Georgia. Originally from Kenya, Jane made the courageous decision to seek asylum in the United States in 2001 with her two daughters and son following the tragic death of her husband. While the Curia family sought a fresh start in their new surroundings, Jane's choice to relocate was also deeply rooted in her vehement opposition to Kenya's brutal regime of female genital mutilation, known as FGM, a practice she and countless other women strongly opposed. Her primary motivation was to shield her two daughters, 19-year-old Isabella and 16-year-old Annabelle, from the harrowing realities of FGM. Jane was employed at a nursing home, where she endeared herself to the residents with her warmth and compassion. As a single parent, she devoted herself tirelessly to ensuring her three children received the best upbringing possible. Jane worked diligently to provide for them, emphasising the importance of hard work in the local community and academic achievements. Her expectations for her children were high, driven by her desire to see them excel and accomplish great things in life. By 2007, Isabella, Jane's eldest child, was attending college, while Annabelle, her second daughter, was actively participating in their church community. Her only son, Jeremy, was still at school and was described as a typical basketball fanatic. Overall, the family seemed to be in a stable and positive place, with each member pursuing their respective interests and endeavours. On the morning of August 1st, 2007, Pauline Tundy reached out to her sister-in-law, Jane Curia, who had been entrusted with caring for Pauline's 11-year-old son, Peter P.K. Tundy. Concern arose when Jane had not been in contact for 24 hours, a departure from her usual routine. Despite several attempts to reach her by phone, all calls went unanswered. 
growing increasingly anxious, Pauline enlisted the help of her niece, 22-year-old Diana Mina, to accompany her to the Curia family's residence to check on their well-being. Upon arriving at the Powder Springs residence, Pauline and Diana ventured through both the front and back doors only to encounter a scene of horror within the home. The house was enveloped in darkness, with only the glow of a cartoon emanating from the television screen. As Diana cautiously navigated through the premises, she was met with the chilling sight of blood staining on the floor and walls, along with the discovery of a lifeless body. In a state of shock and alarm, the pair swiftly contacted the authorities, who promptly arrived at the scene within minutes. Within the home, police made the grim discovery of three lifeless bodies, Jane in the kitchen, along with her two daughters, Isabella on the landing by the front door, and Annabelle in the hallway. They had all suffered fatal injuries from violent bludgeoning, autopsies later indicating the use of a long instrument made of a strong metal or lead, though no weapon was found at the scene. The abundance of blood discovered within the home was staggering. Jane's eight-year-old son, Jeremy, and Pauline's son, PK, who had only recently arrived in the United States 48 hours prior, were also found within the residence in one of the bedrooms. Though badly beaten in a similar fashion to all three women, both boys were still alive and were immediately transported to the nearby hospital for urgent medical care and treatment. Due to the horrific circumstances involved, police protection was put in place for Jeremy and PK whilst they were treated in hospital. Detective John Dawes observed that the crime scene itself seemed to resemble four distinct crime scenes, as there were no blood transfers from one area to another. This lack of blood transfer is highly unusual, particularly if there was only one lone assailant involved. Indeed, the method by which the perpetrator managed to cover their tracks between each killing remains a perplexing mystery. Jane's autopsy indicated that she had likely sensed the impending assault and fought fiercely for her life, showing signs of a struggle. The force used against her was so brutal it was ruled overkill. However, her daughters showed no such signs, suggesting that they were taken by surprise and unaware of the looming threat posed by the assailant lurking in the shadows. As investigators secured the crime scene, they meticulously combed through the Curia residence in search of crucial clues. Based on the evidence gathered, it was surmised that the horrific attack likely transpired during the night of July 31st. Notably, Isabella was documented as having responded to an email shortly after midnight, while Jane had received an unanswered call around 3.30am. These timestamps indicated a window of approximately three and a half hours during which the crime most likely occurred. Despite inquiries made to neighbours, no one reported witnessing or hearing anything out of the ordinary during that time frame. The sliding door at the rear of the residence was found partially open upon Diana and Pauline's arrival, indicating that the perpetrator gained entry to the house without encountering any resistance. Despite thorough examination, no evidence was discovered to suggest any signs of forced entry. While it remains uncertain whether Jane allowed entry to the assailant, investigators ultimately concluded that the individual responsible for the heinous attack was likely someone known to her given the absence of forced entry and the manner in which the crime was carried out. Investigators diligently focused their efforts on uncovering any potential forensic evidence that could provide crucial leads in identifying the perpetrator. Despite thorough examination, no foreign fingerprints, traces of blood or DNA belonging to an unknown individual were found either inside or outside of the home. This absence of tangible evidence compounded the complexity of the case, 
leaving authorities grappling with the perplexing nature of the crime and the elusive identity of the person responsible. Despite extensive questioning of friends, family members and local residents by authorities regarding the murders, investigators were unable to uncover any significant leads. The Curia family was widely respected and law-abiding within the community, and no one could fathom a plausible motive for the brutal attack on a mother and her children. Moreover, the family had no known enemies, further complicating the investigation and leaving law enforcement puzzled by the senseless violence inflicted upon the Curias. During a memorial gathering to honour the Curia family, a detective was approached by an unfamiliar individual who abruptly suggested looking into the Mungiki tribe, originating from the Curia's homeland of Kenya. This tribe, or sect, had a reputation for engaging in violent and deadly assaults driven by political motivations. However, investigators were sceptical of any connection to a crime that occurred in the US. The detective in question speculated that this male individual, who claimed to know Jane from church, might be attempting to divert attention away from the true perpetrator of the crime. He deemed it rather suspicious to suggest a Kenyan tribe as being responsible on the very night the crime was uncovered, and therefore looked into this man. The individual in question, like Jane, was a Kenyan national, who had been residing in the US for a considerable period. Married with a family, he lacked a solid alibi on the day of the murders, as no one could verify his whereabouts. He informed investigators that his wife was at work while he remained home alone. Notably, this individual and his family were acquainted with Jane and attended the same church. Allegedly, one of Jane's daughters, Annabelle, had even babysat for this man's two young sons. The man claimed he often carried out odd jobs for Jane, such as mowing the lawn, as he didn't want to see a single mother struggle. Detectives managed to obtain fingerprints, DNA and a hair sample from him. However, upon analysis, no forensic evidence was found linking him to the crime scene. Despite these connections and the absence of a solid alibi, authorities were unable to establish a definitive link between this individual and the tragic events that unfolded at the Curia residence. The investigation took a suspicious turn when Jane's call logs revealed that she and this man had been engaging in between 10 to 12 phone calls a day for several weeks leading up to the murders. However, on July 31st, the day of the murders, no calls were placed from this man to Jane. When questioned by investigators about this discrepancy, he simply responded with, I don't know. Although this man insisted that he and Jane were merely friends, others, including Jane's niece Diana, suspected that their relationship was more than platonic. Detective John Dawes, who led the investigation, uncovered additional troubling details regarding this man's connections to the Curia family. There were allegations of an inappropriate relationship between him and one of Jane's daughters, whom he frequently took out for dinner alone as payment for babysitting services. Despite these suspicions, he vehemently denied any wrongdoing. Additionally, during his investigation, Detective Dawes discovered that approximately a year before the crime, this man had requested a significant amount of money from Jane, who had agreed to lend it to him. Following this revelation, Jane's finances underwent scrutiny, leading to confusion among those involved in the case. It was rather peculiar that Jane allegedly informed her family that she was anticipating around $30,000 shortly before her death. She attributed this sum to a new real estate venture she had launched with her friends, although no one among her acquaintances were aware of such a business endeavour. Whether this sum of money was related to the debt owed by the unknown man to Jane remains unclear. 
After Jeremy and PK were discharged from the hospital, Detective Dawes interviewed the boys in hopes of obtaining critical information about the events of that fateful night, and more importantly, any details about the assailant. Unfortunately, Jeremy couldn't recall much about the incident. However, PK managed to provide Detective Dawes with a significant lead. He recounted seeing a man speaking in Kenyan tongue, whom he did not recognise. Although PK couldn't see the man's face, he remembered a distinctive floral print shirt the assailant was wearing. Despite the promising lead provided by PK, neither Jeremy nor PK could positively identify the man responsible for the deaths of Jane, Isabella and Annabelle Curia, leaving the investigation at a standstill once again. Additionally, a blood-soaked towel discovered two miles away from the Curia residence the day following the murders did not yield any significant breakthroughs, as DNA testing ruled out any connection to the Curia family or the male person of interest. The possibility that more than one person was involved in the murders remains plausible, yet due to the lack of evidence, no definitive conclusions can be drawn. Regrettably, nobody has ever been arrested or charged in relation to this case. As young adults, both Jeremy and PK made the difficult decision to relocate back to Kenya to be closer to family. However, the memories of that horrific night continue to haunt them and their remaining loved ones. The unanswered questions linger, and all they desire are answers as to why someone could so cruelly snatch away the lives of three cherished women, who had so much yet to experience and contribute to the world. The pain of their loss remains an ever-present shadow in their lives, serving as a constant reminder of the senseless tragedy that befell their family. Anyone with information regarding the Curia family murders are urged to contact the Cobb County District Attorney's Office Cold Case Unit at 770-528-3032. Residents of Greenwich, Connecticut referred to the tragic killing of a 13-year-old schoolboy in 1984 as the end of innocence for their community. Matthew Margolis resided in the Pembroke neighbourhood of Greenwich, fondly referred to by locals as The Valley. His family included his parents and his older sister, Stacy. The year 1983 marked a significant change in Matthew's life when, at the age of 12, his parents divorced, leading to his father moving out of the marital home. In the aftermath, Matthew found solace and support from his maternal grandparents, George and Stella Miazga, who lived just a few blocks away from his home. He developed a close bond with them, frequently spending time at their residence and even staying overnight on a regular basis. In 1984, 13-year-old Matthew was navigating his way through 8th grade at Western Junior High School. He was an average student, but worked hard and was very well liked amongst his peers. A frequent outdoor enthusiast, he spent many days engaged in fishing expeditions with his beloved grandfather. When not by the water's edge, he could be spotted riding his bike to his grandparents' house or hanging out at the local Spartan Deli. Described by those close to him as bright, responsible, polite and loving, Matthew was the type of individual who always sought permission before making plans. Furthermore, he was known for his generous nature, often sharing the fish he caught with others who were less fortunate in their fishing endeavours. Matthew shared an exceptionally close bond with his grandfather, George Miazga, who served as his mentor in the realms of angling and survival skills. The duo frequently immersed themselves in outdoor activities, from foraging edible berries to George imparting wilderness survival knowledge to his grandson. Trout fishing along the Byram River became a cherished activity for the pair. 
Matthew's mother, Marianne, a nurse, expressed that George was her son's very best friend in the world. Their days were typically spent together. However, in the summer of 1984, their routine underwent a significant change when George was diagnosed with an aggressive form of cancer, rendering him bedbound. Although the diagnosis meant an end to their fishing excursions, Matthew, being exceptionally attentive, assumed the role of caregiver for his ailing grandfather. He took charge of ensuring George took his medications and provided companionship when his grandmother was at work. Tragically, in August, George succumbed to the illness, leaving Matthew profoundly devastated by the loss of his beloved grandfather. Despite the absence of George, Matthew persisted in his fishing pursuits along the Byram River. According to his family, this familiar locale remained a source of joy and solace for him, a haven that provided comfort amid the challenges and turbulence he had faced in the wake of his grandfather's passing. On August 30th, 1984, during the Labour Day weekend, Matthew spent the night at his grandparents' home with plans to embark on an early morning fishing trip the next day. His mother, Marianne, who had just completed a double shift at the hospital the day before, had a rare day off that Friday. When she arrived at her mother's residence in the early hours, she checked on her two children, finding them both still fast asleep. Choosing not to disturb them, she left in her car to run some errands during her day off. On the morning of August 31st, Matthew rose with the sun and set out on his bike for the river. Around 9.30am, he made a stop at the deli on Morgan Avenue to gather supplies for the day, including a carton of milk and a pastry. Although only two weeks had passed since his grandfather's death, these trips to the river provided Matthew with some solace. His destination was a bridge on Comley Avenue. About half an hour later, a woman engaged in a brief conversation with the schoolboy. Observing a line of fish by Matthew's side, she inquired about his catch, to which he replied, they were really biting. After some time, Matthew decided to explore upstream, towards the east side of the river along Pemberwick Road. Around 11.30am, with the intention of returning to his grandparents' residence, he set out on the journey home. At approximately 12 noon, Matthew's grandmother, Stella, returned home for lunch. Although Matthew was not present, it was evident that he had been there recently, as dripping wet corduroy trousers were hanging on the back of a chair in the living room, and some trout were discovered in the kitchen. Before leaving to attend to her own errands, Stella left a note for her grandson, instructing him to dispose of the fish in the sink. Around 5pm, Marianne returned to her recently widowed mother's residence after a busy day of running errands. Her plan was to collect Matthew and bring him home for dinner. However, upon arriving, the house was eerily silent and Matthew was nowhere to be found. Both Stella and Stacy were also absent as Stacy had an appointment and her grandmother had taken her. Marianne decided to wait until they returned, thinking Matthew might have possibly gone with them, but as the hours passed, there was still no sign of him. At approximately 7pm, overwhelmed with worry, Matthew's mother called the police to report her 13-year-old son as missing. A deep sense of foreboding gripped her, as she couldn't shake the feeling that something terribly wrong had happened. The evening Matthew went missing, family members, police, a youth division officer, neighbours and local volunteers diligently searched the area, including the Byron River, hoping to find any sign of him, but their efforts were in vain. Contacting his friends yielded no information, as nobody had seen him in recent hours. The following day, the search efforts intensified with the involvement of divers, helicopter teams and firefighters brought in to aid the search. 
Matthew's father, Paul, residing in Dallas, Texas at the time, was contacted, but he informed the police that he hadn't seen or heard from his son. As the search continued, the FBI became involved and Marianne, Matthew's mother, made an emotional plea for information about her son's whereabouts in the Greenwich Times newspaper. Matthew's sudden and unexplained disappearance was highly unusual and a cause for significant concern. With fears that he might have fallen into the river, the focus of the search remained on the water in the following days. Sniffer dogs were brought in to assist and managed to track Matthew's scent to a waterfall below a dam on the river, but the trail abruptly stopped there. Despite divers searching in the water, no trace of Matthew was found. The search for Matthew extended to various locations, including an abandoned house on a nearby farm and St Mary's graveyard, where his recently deceased grandfather had been buried just weeks prior. Unfortunately, these searches also yielded no results. Posters and flyers were distributed throughout the Greenwich area, appealing to anyone with information to come forward. The police also scoured an area known as the Mill, where people often went for work, shopping or socialising, but no leads were established there. After four days of intense searching, the efforts had to be scaled back due to the lack of any leads. At this point, authorities were inclined to believe that Matthew had fallen into the river and drowned. The focus shifted to searching for a body, as the possibility of a tragic outcome became more prominent in their minds. A few days before Matthew's disappearance, he had inquired with his mother, Mary Ann, about the area near Pemberwick Road and Hawthorne Street, leading to a secluded spot known as Glenville. When questioned about his interest, Matthew simply mentioned his curiosity. Mary Ann, concerned, asked if someone had prompted him to go there, but he denied it. She advised him not to visit the area alone, to which he acknowledged. During the search on September 2nd, Mary Ann and her soon-to-be husband, Jim, detected a foul odour emanating from a rocky dump site near the woods at the end of Hawthorne Street. They promptly informed the police, but the authorities dismissed it as the result of rotten fish left by anglers frequenting the area. Skeptical, Mary Ann found it hard to believe this explanation. After six anguishing days of searching, on September 5th, the search was called off following the discovery of a young boy in a wooded area on a hill near a ravine. This location was adjacent to Pemberwick Road near Hawthorne Street and Greenway Drive, just a mile away from where Matthew was last seen. The discovery was made by a 38-year-old local volunteer firefighter named Fred Lambert, who had experience in such searches. Lambert found a black and white checkered sneaker similar to the ones Matthew was last seen wearing while walking along a forest path not far from the mill area. He marked the spot and promptly alerted the police. Around 4pm, two youth division officers arrived at the site alongside Lambert and began searching the steep and rocky forest terrain. While leaning against a tree for a moment, Lambert noticed what appeared to be a child's foot protruding from underneath some foliage. It soon became apparent that authorities were not dealing with a boy who had run away distraught over his grandfather's death, who was looking for peace, nor an accidental death by drowning, but something much more sinister. A homicide. Matthew's body was discovered in a shallow grave, partially covered by leaves, and investigators determined that he had been there for a considerable amount of time. Shockingly, the 13-year-old had sustained multiple stab wounds to the torso, an autopsy revealed that Matthew had attempted to defend himself against his attacker, but succumbed to multiple stab wounds and traumatic asphyxiation. Specifically, he had been strangled and suffocated with dirt forced down his throat. 
His athletic shorts and shoes were found in close proximity to his remains, and he was still wearing a t-shirt and undershorts. Pathologists concluded that there was no evidence of sexual assault. Police could not determine whether Matthew was killed at the site where he was found, or if he was attacked elsewhere before his body was discarded in the woods. The knife used in the attack, a 10 and a half inch Foster Brothers boning knife, was found nearby. However, it is unclear whether the knife underwent forensic examination or if any DNA was ever taken from the blade. Interestingly, the fishing rod that Matthew had taken with him that day was initially not located. Eventually, it was found in the possession of an individual claiming to be a friend who stated that Matthew had sold it to them. Mary Ann, Matthew's mother, was sceptical of this claim, as the fishing pole had been a gift from Matthew's late grandfather. However, this friend was never identified and they were not considered a suspect or person of interest, despite likely being the last person to see Matthew alive. In the year 2000, Matthew's case files were released by the Greenwich Police in response to a request from the Freedom of Information Commission. The files had been sealed to avoid compromising an active investigation. Some specific details in the files were redacted. Many raised questions about how the Greenwich Police handled the early stages of the investigation. Notably, no specific officer was initially assigned to tackle Matthew's missing persons report, which was considered a significant oversight likely to have delayed normal proceedings. Even after an officer was eventually assigned to investigate the murder, only one detective physically visited the crime scene. The lack of coordination in this particular investigation faced scrutiny. According to the case files, sightings of Matthew were reported in several places around Pemberwick in the afternoon and early evening, including his grandmother's driveway and the deli, a popular hangout spot for teenagers at the time. A group of older teenage boys, known as the Valley Boys, were often seen around the deli and were involved in petty crime and drug use. Some sources suggest that Matthew had confronted these boys about their behaviour and the risks of taking drugs. However, conflicting reports from Matthew's friends also indicate that, in the weeks following his grandfather's death, he was seen spending time with the Valley Boys. On the day Matthew was last seen, August 31st, a group of approximately 12 of these boys was spotted near the deli between 5.15 and 5.30pm. Three to five individuals were considered potential persons of interest, and among them was a known neighbourhood bully, whose house was just beyond where Matthew's body was found. One man claimed that this male individual had threatened his own son with a similar knife just weeks prior. Additionally, this person had a friend from Port Chester with a criminal record who frequently went angling down by the Byram River. The friend was notably uncooperative with authorities. The possibility was raised that Matthew may have gone exploring in the Glenville area, despite being told not to and was subsequently attacked. Three search warrants were granted by a court judge, but this occurred long after the crime had been committed and nothing of significance was found in relation to Matthew Margola's death. Police, however, remain certain that the truth lies within Greenwich itself and that the perpetrator of this heinous crime was a local male. The central and haunting question that lingers in the minds of many is simple. Why? Matthew was a well-behaved, quiet and kind boy. The circumstances that led to his life being brutally stolen from him remain elusive, and this unanswered question adds to the complexity and tragedy of the case. Matthew's family persists in their quest for justice, holding on to the hope that someday they will find the answers they seek. Marianne, his mother, maintains a vow to never give up hope in the pursuit of justice for her son.
Following a funeral service at St. Paul's Roman Catholic Church, attended by over 500 people, Matthew was laid to rest near his grandfather in St. Mary's Cemetery in Greenwich, Connecticut. Despite the outpouring of grief and the community's desire for justice, no arrests have been made in this case. The lack of evidence has hindered the progress of the police in identifying the person responsible for taking the life of an innocent 13-year-old boy, especially in the wake of his grandfather's passing just two weeks prior. In 2001, a reward of $60,000 was offered for any information leading to the arrest and conviction of Matthew's killer. However, it remains unknown if this reward offer still stands. The investigation into the murder of Matthew Margolis remains open and active. If you have any information regarding this case which could be useful to the authorities, you can contact the Greenwich Police tip line at 203-622-3333. In the realm of unresolved mysteries haunting communities, the disappearance of three-year-old William Tyrrell is a poignant enigma. In September of 2014, a picturesque town in New South Wales, Australia, became the backdrop for a tragedy that shook the nation. On the 11th of September 2014, young William Tyrrell, aged three, set out on a four-hour journey from Sydney's North Shore district, accompanied by his five-year-old sister and his foster parents, a wealthy and educated couple who lived in a four million Australian dollar home. Their destination was the residence of his foster grandmother in Kendall, a location where his grandmother's house, situated on Benaroon Drive, faces a bush road leading to the Kendall State Forest. This tranquil abode lies about 22 miles south of Port Macquarie. It was reported by several news outlets that William was far from a typical three-year-old and had a number of chronic health conditions. This included hearing problems, speech issues, and motor problems. He often fell over, which resulted in injury, and often had a cough or a cold. He attended daycare several times a week, where many of these problems were noted. This also included the fact that he had played alone much of the time and appeared unhappy. He was a child who had recently been taken from the family home and placed into foster care, a huge adjustment for any child, but especially one with developmental issues. The following morning on September 12th, between 10 and 10.25 a.m., Tyrrell and his sister engaged in a game of hide-and-seek in both the front and backyards of their foster grandmother's Benaroom Drive home. Meanwhile, his foster mother and foster grandmother observed the playful activities from outside, snapping some photographs of both William and his sister, drawing with crayons on the balcony, William dressed in a Spider-Man costume. At this point, his foster mother decided to step indoors to prepare a cup of tea. However, concern arose when, after a span of five minutes, she realised she hadn't heard William. Consequently, she initiated a thorough search within the yard, house and surrounding woodland. Simultaneously, Tyrrell's foster father returned from a business errand in Lakewood, immediately joining the effort by scouring the street and knocking on neighbouring doors to ask if anyone had seen William. At 10.57, Tyrrell's foster mother contacted Triple Zero Emergency Services to report his disappearance. The New South Wales Police Force responded promptly, arriving at the scene by approximately 11.06 a.m. The last vivid recollection his foster mother had was of William playfully imitating a tiger's roar as he sprinted towards the side of the home, dressed in his Spider-Man attire. Suddenly, a hush fell, and he vanished. Despite her earnest efforts to locate him, his foster mother's search proved futile. 
Following William's disappearance, a massive operation unfolded with hundreds of police officers, state emergency service and rural fire service members, as well as community volunteers tirelessly conducting day and night searches for the three-year-old boy. Specialised police units, including the sex crime squad from Strike Force, were mobilised in the search. The search efforts were intensified shortly afterwards with the deployment of motorcycles and helicopters to search the ground and air for any sign of the missing toddler, who at this point, according to authorities, possibly wandered off into the woods and got lost or was abducted. 200 dedicated volunteers worked tirelessly overnight, scouring the rugged terrain surrounding the Kendall home while police divers meticulously searched waterways and dams. Every house in the estate encompassing Benaroon Drive underwent repeated searches by the police for any clues as to William's whereabouts. Although detection dogs were brought in and managed to pick up little William's scent, their success was limited to the confines of the backyard, which was disheartening for the search teams. The creation of Strike Force Roseanne on September 16th marked a pivotal development comprising adept investigators from the State Crime Command with specialised experience in handling the perplexing disappearances of young children. This 14 squad unit played a crucial role in providing support to the police, emergency services personnel and community members engaged in the extensive search efforts. Despite their dedicated work, after a span of five days, the police reached a dead end in their search for William, having recovered no clues as to his whereabouts or anything which could indicate what had happened to him. Authorities were now steering towards the idea that William had been victim of an abduction. Subsequent to the initial phase of the investigation, the police turned their attention towards identifying the drivers of two cars observed parked on the dead end road on the morning Tyrrell went missing, both of which had been reportedly observed by William's foster mother. These vehicles, described as a white station wagon and an older style grey sedan, were situated between two driveways. Notably, their driver's side windows were down, and they were unfamiliar in that Kendall neighbourhood, where residents typically knew one another and were friendly. What is interesting to note here is that neither of these vehicles were seen in the neighbourhood thereafter the foster mother's sighting, which raised suspicions with the police. The sightings of these vehicles were seen at 9am and 10.30am respectively, with the grey sedan being sighted earlier in the day when William and his sister were riding their bikes in the driveway. The white station wagon was observed around the time William disappeared and reportedly was seen speeding down another street close by shortly thereafter. Interestingly, as not to compromise the integrity of their investigation, information about these two vehicles were not released to the public until a year later. During the very early stages of the investigation, William's family were ruled out of having been involved in his disappearance and were of the opinion that he had been kidnapped by an opportunistic stranger who may have ties to a paedophile ring. Around 20 people living in the Kendall area who were previous sex offenders were extensively questioned, including a man who went on to sue the state over false allegations of previous sexual offences and was subsequently awarded substantial damages. However, all were eventually ruled out in this case of any involvement. Two persons of interest arose when it was alleged that two child sex offenders met near Benaroon Drive on the day Tyrrell vanished. Both men apparently owned vehicles similar to the ones cited by William's foster mother. The men were both questioned by the police, but denied meeting and even being friends for that matter. One of the men came home drunk that afternoon, though he claimed he had been searching the bush for metal scraps. In the two years following Tyrrell's disappearance, the investigation team received over 1,000 reported sightings from vigilant individuals from across the state and beyond, the total calls from members of the public to Australian Crime Stoppers being 2,800 since the beginning of the investigation. 
Among these reports was a photograph capturing a man and a young boy in Queensland, with the latter bearing a striking resemblance to William Tyrrell. However, within 24 hours, another call clarified that the boy in question was not him. Early in 2015, two passengers and a member of a flight crew en route to New Zealand believed that they spotted William on board, with the police promptly meeting the aircraft upon landing. However, this lead was also proved to be fruitless, as the boy was not the missing toddler. Another photograph, which was sent to investigators, depicted a young boy and a woman at a McDonald's restaurant in central Queensland. The boy, once again, shared similarities with Tyrrell, and the accompanying woman resembled his foster grandmother. Subsequent police investigations confirmed that neither the woman nor the boy were connected to the case. Once again, the investigation hit a dead end. Over the course of the investigation, over 1,000 people were questioned, and over 690 persons of interest were interviewed, unfortunately with no new leads being established. As time progressed, authorities became less convinced that William had been abducted, and following new lines of inquiry, looked into the possibility that the boy met with some kind of foul play and closer to home. With time came controversy over William's parents, biological and foster, and the fact his biological parents could not be named or identified in the media for legal reasons. Because of this, William's parents could not appeal to the public for information regarding their son's disappearance, only being able to do so anonymously. An action which was criticised by many, as this could have prevented critical information from coming to the fore for investigators. Due to the fact that he was in the foster care system and he disappeared under the care of his foster parents, it was declared by the Supreme Court that William's disappearance was one of legitimate public interest. The New South Wales government, following backlash, released a statement which reiterated the fact that their, quote, key priority is to always act in the interests of the safety and well-being of children and not in any way to jeopardise ongoing police investigations. It should be noted that William's biological parents were quickly ruled out of having any involvement in his disappearance after receipts showed that they were shopping in Blacktown at the time. The circumstances surrounding their son being placed in foster care isn't exactly clear. However, his mother and father were long-term unemployed. His mother struggled with substance abuse, both experienced incidents involving domestic violence, and his mother often ran into issues with law enforcement, this resulting in custody being lost. Both of their children ended up in the same foster home, and they hoped that their foster family could offer their children everything they ever dreamt of. Despite being in foster care, William's biological parents still had visitation rights, though according to his foster family, this often confused him. At the time he vanished, however, the foster parents were looking to adopt William, despite the fact that his foster mother claimed William would often act out especially with her often biting her and hitting her. She blamed his, quote, erratic behaviour on his biological appearance. On June 12th, 2018, authorities disclosed their plans to initiate an extensive forensic search spanning three to four weeks in the bushland encompassing Kendall and the Benaroon Drive home. The operation, led by search specialists from the Public Order and Riot Squad, aimed to cover substantial ground in order to recover any potential evidence. Moving forward to November 15th, 2021, the New South Wales Police declared a renewed search for Tyrrell's remains in three regions surrounding the town. This initiative was prompted by new evidence that had come to light, prompting authorities to approach the search with the assumption that they would be focusing on locating his remains, rather than finding him alive. During the 2021 inquest, a woman who was identified as Tanya told the court that two brothers she babysat for told her that they had been threatened by a local man that they had seen burying a suitcase, which this male individual told them contained the body of William Tyrrell. 
This, along with other evidence which came to light, heightened suspicions that William was no longer alive. In April of 2022, his foster mother, whose identity is protected by state law, was charged with giving false and or misleading information to the New South Wales Crimes Commission hearing regarding an incident in which she denied hitting another child with a wooden spoon, but she was found not guilty that November. However, significant developments emerged in 2023, nine years after William's disappearance. In June, police told the public that despite various searches over the years and the use of forensics, police could not ascertain exactly what fate befell William Tyrrell. However, on June 27th, police recommended charges against William's foster mother for perverting the course of justice and interfering with a corpse. This was due to new evidence coming to light, which indicated that William possibly fell from perhaps a black butt tree or the first floor balcony of the Benaroon Drive residence, and in response, his foster mother may have concealed his accidental death and subsequently disposed of his body. It was also suggested that perhaps he was hit by his foster father's car when he returned home, but there was zero evidence to substantiate this particular idea. The main conclusion, however, is that the cover-up may have been to prevent William's sister being taken away from the family by social services. It should be noted that Tyrrell's foster mother in 2021 pleaded guilty to two counts of assaulting another foster child previously in their care, which was notably not William. His foster mother, known in newspaper articles as S.D., was grilled by police at Parramatta Police Station. During the interview, she gave conflicting accounts regarding the events of that fateful day. Sydney detectives suggested that she and the foster grandmother, who is now deceased, somehow covered up a tragic accident. The previously mentioned sighting of the two cars on the street seen shortly prior to William's disappearance were not witnessed by anyone else, according to police, and a number of deleted text messages were noted from her to William's foster father, known as J.S., including completely innocent, everyday texts. The timeline of events contradicted what neighbours told authorities. However, the foster father himself was ruled out as a suspect in this case, having been away from business and having arrived home at 10.33, as written in a text three minutes prior that he was almost home, this being one of the texts which had been mysteriously deleted by William's foster mother. According to her, it wasn't unusual for her to delete, quote, unimportant text messages. Police were sceptical of SD's timeline of events, as the final photo she took of her foster son in his Spider-Man suit was at 9.37am, but he wasn't reported missing until over an hour later. She told police that she started searching for him right away, but neighbours didn't see anyone out looking until after the foster father had returned home at 10.30am. During her interview, she also tried to lay suspicion on her neighbours, calling one out as being, quote, odd, and said her mother also felt the same. This neighbour was initially seen as a suspect due to these comments, however was later exonerated. At some point during the morning William disappeared, according to police, SD drove her mother's car down to Batar Creek Road, four kilometres away from Benaroon Drive, which became a huge search site for police in 2021. It was believed that SD possibly buried William's remains in that area. As of January 2024, the New South Wales Director of Public Prosecutions is anticipated to provide guidance on the feasibility of pressing charges against the foster mother, who to this day maintains she had nothing to do with William's disappearance. The question is whether there is enough evidence to press charges against her or anyone else who may have been involved, and it seems only time will tell. The inquest will resume in the coming days. There is currently a one million Australian dollar reward for information leading to William's whereabouts, which was initially posted on September 12th, 2016, two years after he disappeared. This reward will be granted on the condition that the guilty party or parties are arrested and convicted, and on the condition that William's remains are recovered. 
This reward is the highest offered by the state of New South Wales for a missing person in its history. If, by some miracle, William is still alive today in 2024, he would be turning 13 years old. Those with any information regarding the disappearance of William Tyrrell are urged to contact Australian Crime Stoppers on 1800 333 000. Jacob Erwin Wetterling was born on the 17th of February 1978 in Long Prairie, Minnesota, to proud parents Jerry and Patty Wetterling. Jacob and his eldest sister, Amy, and two younger siblings, Trevor and Carmen, grew up in the St. Joseph's area of Minnesota. In October of 1989, Jacob was in sixth grade. He was a very well-liked student and, like most of us, was not a massive fan of homework. He was very passionate about sports. He played hockey, where he was goalie for the school team. He played basketball and he was a massive fan of football and even wanted to play football professionally as a career when he got older. Jacob's father coached the youth football team in the area which Jacob was a part of. Father and son bonded through this, but also bonded through fishing trips together. Jacob was learning the trombone, and he adored animals, and if he wasn't a football player later in life, he wanted to be a veterinarian. Jacob's mother, Patty, is quoted as saying, Jacob was a fun, active, athletic 11-year-old boy who loved peanut butter and football. He was most known for his sense of fairness. On Sunday the 22nd of October 1989, Jacob and his father Jerry went for an early morning fishing trip. They wanted to return before midday because the Vikings game was due to start around about that time. Jerry and Jacob returned home and watched the game, and after it had concluded, Jerry and his two sons, Jacob and Trevor, went out into the garden and played some football before coming back inside. That night, the Wetterling family had no set-in-stone plans. Jerry and Patty decided on a whim that they would go to a friend's house for a party. However, this presented them with a problem. Their eldest daughter, Amy, was at a sleepover that night, so they actually asked Jacob if he could babysit his younger brother, Trevor, who was 10, and his younger sister, Carmen, who was 8 at this time. Jacob agreed to this, but asked his parents if his best friend, 11-year-old Aaron Larson, could come over to keep him company, to which his parents agreed, as the boys didn't have school the following day. The Wetterling parents left, and once they arrived at their friend's residence, they phoned the house to give Jacob the number of the friend's house, so that if there was any sort of emergency, or if he needed anything, he could contact them. It's not entirely clear due to conflicting sources, but either Jacob or Trevor phoned their mother whilst at the party, and asked if the three boys, Trevor, Jacob and Aaron, could bike up to the Tom Thumb convenience store to rent out a video and buy some snacks. Patty was quite an overprotective parent, and because of this, she said no. But when they spoke to their father, he agreed that the boys could go, on the condition that they were wearing reflective clothing, as it was very dark. During this time, the boys managed to get their next-door neighbour to come over to babysit Carmen whilst they were gone, as she didn't want to go to the convenience store with them. After a short while, the neighbour who was looking after Carmen, Marilyn Jerzak, phoned the Wetterling parents at the party in a panicked state. He told them that they had to come home immediately, and it was because their son, Jacob, was missing. Jerry, who answered the phone, told his wife and they left the party straight away. This was when Marilyn phoned the police and told them about what had happened with the help of Trevor and Aaron, who were extremely shaken up. 
At around 9pm that night, as the boys were biking home from the convenience store, an unknown man appeared from the woods and walked onto the road towards them. This occurred approximately half a mile away from the Wetterling home. The man was wearing a black mask and dark clothing, and in his hands, to the boys' horror, was a revolver. The man ordered the boys to throw their bikes into a nearby ditch, and that they lay face down on the road. The man then asked each of the boys what their ages were, Jacob replying, I am 11 years old. The man decided pretty swiftly that he didn't want Jacob's younger brother Trevor, who was 10, and sent him running into the woods, but told him not to look back. If he did, the man said that he would shoot him. The man then asked Jacob and Aaron to look up at him, before he told Aaron the same thing that he had told Trevor, to run into the woods, not turn back, and that if he did, he'd shoot him. This was the very last time that anyone saw Jacob Wetterling alive. Law enforcement, including the FBI, investigated where Jacob was last seen and turned up various tyre marks and some footprints. Officers and volunteers conducted aerial and ground searches and this caused media to jump into a frenzy and Jacob's case was all over the news. Because of this media campaign, there were hundreds of leads within just days of Jacob's disappearance. The Wetterling family tried absolutely everything in their power to get Jacob's name and his face out there. Flyers and posters were made with the help of the investigators and these were distributed amongst the local community and those living farther away. Over time, Jacob's mother, Patty, even hired private investigators and at one point went to see a clairvoyant to see if they had any potential information regarding the whereabouts of her lost son. But because of all of this and the vast amount of money that was spent on these resources, it did put a massive strain on the Wetterling marriage. As the years went by, the Wetterling family never gave up hope, praying that someday their beloved son would come home to them. Unfortunately, in the mid-2010s, almost 27 years after Jacob vanished, new evidence came to light and the Wetterlings would find the truth about what happened to their son that night. It was revealed that on January 13th of 1989, the same year that Jacob disappeared, a 12-year-old boy named Jared Shirell was kidnapped, sexually assaulted and threatened by an unknown man. This occurred in Cold Spring, which was just 10 miles from where Jacob, Aaron and Trevor were stopped. The MO, or modus operandi, was extremely similar in both cases. The man had threatened them with a gun, told them to run off into the woods, and that if they looked back, they would be shot. It was also important to note here that Aaron and Trevor's description of this man was extremely similar to Jared's description of the man that had kidnapped him. Average height, average weight, with a very low and raspy voice. In 2014, investigators said that they were going to have a look again at a series of kidnappings slash sexual assaults that had happened between the summer of 1986 and the spring of 1987, where five boys were attacked. They were obviously in similar circumstances, but nobody was actually arrested for the crimes. With the help of an internet blogger called Joy Baker, who deeply researched the case, and after investigators re-interviewed some of the victims, they finally came to the conclusion that they firmly believed that the person who had attacked Jared was the same person who had attacked the boys. It was the same individual. In October 2015, a man named Daniel James Heinrich was publicly named as a person of interest in regards to the disappearance of Jacob Wetterling. Daniel, who was more commonly known as Danny, had actually already been questioned by the FBI on the 16th of December 1989, and a DNA sample was also taken. 
Danny wasn't charged with anything and was later released. Soon enough, investigators discovered Danny's DNA on Jared Shirell's sweater, the boy who had been attacked in the January of 1989. The FBI managed to match Danny's DNA to the DNA that was found on Jared's sweater, but unfortunately due to the statute of limitations which had expired by this point, the police were unable to arrest or charge Danny with the crime. A warrant was granted for police to search Danny's property in Annandale, Minnesota, where they discovered 19 three-ring binders full of pornography. They also found a pair of silver handcuffs, duct tape, camouflage trousers and top and four bins full with young boys' athletic wear. As it turned out, Danny was making his own pornography, using images from a 1970s yearbook and by using images off the internet. After police discovered what was in Danny's house, he was arrested on the 28th of October 2015. Also of note, found in Danny's residence were a number of very disturbing amateur videos. These videos were of young children in the neighbourhood, rising bicycles, delivering newspapers, playing in the local playgrounds and participating in sports activities. More disturbingly, however, were videos of Jacob Wetterling's disappearance on the news, and he even had the anniversary specials of Jacob's disappearance, with videos showing Jerry and Patty Wetterling begging for more information on the whereabouts of their son. Interestingly, back in 1998, investigators had actually searched Danny's residence. He was living with his father where he had been living since the November of 1989. They were looking for Jacob, any clothing, a handgun, anything that could potentially lead back to him. Police found and collected two police scanners, a carrying case, a list of police frequencies, a pair of boots and some clothing. During the search, Heinrich told investigators that he was most likely home on the day that Jacob disappeared and that he was almost certain that he wasn't in the St. Joseph's area on the day Wetterling vanished. During this search, investigators found a trunk full of pictures of young children. Heinrich objected to the police seizing these items as he said that they, quote, just didn't look right. Later on, Danny admitted that he had actually burned all of this. This incident was unfortunately never taken any further. The forensic results for the shoe prints and tire tracks came back, but unfortunately with very disheartening results. The tire treads were similar to Heinrich's car, but they weren't an exact match and the same results came with the shoe. It was very credible, but investigators didn't have enough detail to confirm that the shoe belonged to Heinrich, so the results were inconclusive. After this, Danny was allowed back in his home after the warrants had been lifted. The police up until this point really had no solid evidence to link Danny to Jacob. On the 31st of August 2016, Danny finally decided to cooperate with authorities on the grounds that he would be given a plea bargain, meaning that he would not be charged with the murder of Jacob Wetterling, but would face a single charge of possession of child pornography. But this was only if he fully cooperated with the authorities. Heinrich agreed to plead guilty to one of the 25 federal child pornography charges laid against him and, in addition, he was willing to tell police officers of the location of Jacob's body and he also wanted to tell them what he did to him. The following day, September 1st, Danny Heinrich led the FBI to a burial site in a pasture near Painesville, which was about 30 miles away from the Wetterling home and only about 10 minutes away from where Danny had been living at the time of Jacob's abduction. Jacob's clothing and remains were discovered in a shallow grave. It was only through dental records that authorities could confirm that these remains did indeed belong to Jacob Wetterling. 
On the 6th of September 2016, Danny, who was 53 at the time, admitted in court how he abducted, assaulted, murdered and buried Jacob Wetterling. During this, Heinrich also confessed to the attack on Jared Shirel. The events of that night, according to Danny Heinrich, are as follows. On the night Jacob vanished, Heinrich was driving along the road where he saw three boys on their bikes. He parked his car on the curb and waited for the boys to come closer whilst putting on his black mask. After getting rid of Trevor Wetterling and Aaron Larson, Heinrich drove a handcuffed Jacob from St. Joseph to Painesville. Whilst sitting in the front seat of the car, Jacob was crying and asked Danny, quote, what did I do wrong? Danny took Jacob to a gravel pit outside of town, removed Jacob from the car, removed his clothing and took him into a grove of trees where he sexually assaulted him. Danny was able to avoid police to begin with due to his police scanners. However, as time progressed, he heard police sirens and this sent him into a panic. He believed that the police were coming for him. Whilst he was panicking, Jacob started to cry and he said, quote, I'm cold, take me home. During Danny's panic, he told Jacob to turn around, and this was where Danny pulled the trigger on his gun. The first time, the gun jammed, but the second time, he shot 11-year-old Jacob, and he fell to the ground. Danny walked back home to the Plaza Hotel, where he had been staying, and an hour later, he returned to the murder site, where he put Jacob in a shallow grave. Heinrich returned to the burial site approximately a year later, only to find some of Jacob's remains had been uncovered, including a part of the schoolboy's jacket. He removed Jacob's remains from the burial site to a farm across the highway, where he dug a trench two feet deep, where he put Jacob's body, and that was where Jacob remained for 27 years. After Danny admitted what he had done to Jacob and told the police where he had buried him, he got his plea deal and was only sentenced to 20 years behind bars, which is the maximum sentence anyone can get for child pornography charges. He could be released from prison in 12 years or so, but due to the brutality of this crime, that is highly unlikely. Just four months after Jacob Wetterling disappeared, his parents Jerry and Patty set up the Jacob Wetterling Foundation, an advocacy for the safety of children. The foundation was later renamed in 2008 to the Jacob Wetterling Resource Centre, which helps educate members of the public on the types of people who take children, how they do it, and how we can prevent it from happening. If there was any light to come from this tragic case, it was that in 1994, the Jacob Wetterling Act was passed, this being the first law to institute a registry for sex offenders. It's difficult to comprehend the agony faced by Jacob's loved ones following his disappearance, the anguish of not knowing where he was or what had happened to him, only to discover 27 years later that, heartbreakingly, Jacob had died the very night he vanished. Following the discovery of Jacob's remains, his family released a short statement on the Jacob Wetterling Resource Centre Facebook page, quote, We are in deep grief. We didn't want Jacob's story to end this way. In this moment of pain and shock, we go back to the beginning. The Wetterlings had a choice to walk into bitterness and anger or to walk into a light of what could be, a light of hope. Their choice changed the world. This light has been burning for close to 27 years. The spark began in the moments after the abduction of Jacob Wetterling, when his family decided that light is stronger than darkness. They lit the flame that became Jacob's hope. All of central Minnesota flocked to and fanned the flame, hoping for answers. 
The light spread statewide, nationally and globally, as hearts connected to the 11-year-old boy who liked to play goalie for his hockey team, wanted to be a footballer, played the trombone and loved the times he spent with his sisters, brother and parents. Today we gather around the same flame, the flame that has become more than the hope for one as it led the way home for thousands of others. It's the light that illuminates a world that Jacob believed in, where things are fair and just. Our hearts are heavy, but we are being held up by all of the people who have been a part of making Jacob's hope a light that will never be extinguished. It shines on in a different way. We are, and we will continue to be, Jacob's hope. Jacob, you are loved. On August the 4th, 2002, the quiet town of Soham in Cambridgeshire, England was rocked by a devastating tragedy. Two young girls were reported missing and a massive search operation was launched. Unfortunately, their lives were cut short when their bodies were found near RAF Lakenheath, Suffolk on August 17th, 2002. Their deaths shook the whole world, and the investigation that followed shed light on the events that led to their vanishing and murder. Holly Marie Wells and Jessica Amy Chapman shared an unbreakable bond as best friends. Holly, born on July 1st, 1991, possessed an unwavering devotion to music and dance, alongside being an esteemed member of the St Andrew's Church Choir in Soham. Renowned for her compassion and generosity, she left a lasting impression on all who knew her. Jessica, born on September 21st, 1985, embraced her tomboy nature, relishing sports, particularly football. Her vivacious spirit, coupled with her humorous and outgoing nature, defined her character. Their journey together commenced at St Andrews, their primary school, and continued through their shared tenure at the Soham Village College. On the afternoon of August 4th, 2002, at 11.45am, Jessica Chapman embarked from her Brook Street residence in Soham, heading to her best friend Holly Wells' home on Red House Gardens. Her purpose was heartfelt, to gift Holly a personally engraved necklace bearing the letter H, a souvenir from her recent family vacation to Menorca. Engaged in computer games and music, alongside their mutual friend, Natalie Parr, the trio enjoyed each other's company for approximately 30 minutes until Parr departed for home. At 3.15pm, both girls donned matching Manchester United football shirts. One belonged to Holly while the other was borrowed from her brother, Oliver. Captured in a photograph taken by Wells' mother at 5.04pm wearing these matching shirts, the girls later joined the guests for dinner before returning upstairs to continue their activities. Unbeknownst to their families at the time, that exact photograph would soon become one of the most recognised photos in British true crime history. Around 6.15pm, the girls quietly slipped out of the house to indulge in a sweet treat from a nearby sports centre, neglecting to inform anyone of their spontaneous outing. A CCTV camera captured their last known sighting near the sports centre at precisely 6.28pm, clad in their matching red Manchester United football shirts. Concern mounted as the evening progressed, prompting both the Wells and Chapman families to reach out to each other at around 8pm, mutually puzzled about the girls' whereabouts. As anxiety swelled, the girls' absence became increasingly distressing, leading their worried parents to alert the authorities at 9.55pm when the girls missed their 8.30pm curfew. Holly and Jessica, cautious around strangers and well-versed in safety lessons since childhood, exhibited behaviour vastly out of character, immediately sparking grave concern for their well-being. 
A massive search operation ensued, involving over 500 police officers and volunteers, and the nation was gripped by the story of the missing schoolgirls. House-to-house inquiries were conducted across Soham. Meanwhile, a number of terrains were searched in an effort to find any clues as to the whereabouts of Holly and Jessica. The police highly suspected abduction and looked into various known child predators across the county, all of whom were questioned and eliminated from the investigation. During the ongoing search for the missing girls, authorities meticulously reconstructed the sequence of their final known actions, releasing this information to the public in a bid to trigger any recollections that might prove helpful. Both the Wells and Chapman families fervently implored the public for any nugget of information that might shed light on the girls' whereabouts. Encircled by the unwavering support of their loved ones, the families drew strength from their community. The appeal resulted in a staggering influx of over 2,000 tips provided to law enforcement. Meanwhile, investigative efforts pursued credible sightings and vehicles potentially linked to the girls' disappearance. As the community stood united in hope, a poignant candlelight vigil held on August 7th served as a collective expression of concern and solidarity. On August 5th, a significant turn in the case occurred when Ian Huntley, a caretaker at Soham Village College, approached the police, providing what could be pivotal information. Aged 28, Huntley disclosed that the previous afternoon, while washing his dog on his doorstep, he had a conversation with Holly and Jessica. He described the girls as cheerful and content, noting their interest in his girlfriend at the time, Maxine Carr, who had formerly served as a teaching assistant at their primary school. Huntley recounted informing them that Carr hadn't secured the job, prompting the girls to express their regret. He recalled their departure, mentioning that they were headed towards College Street, making their way to a bridge leading to Clay Street. Right from the outset, law enforcement harboured suspicions regarding Ian Huntley's narrative of events. Despite a thorough search of his residence on August 5th, yielding no incriminating evidence, officers observed peculiarities that raised concerns. Despite heavy rain, laundry hung on the line outside, drawing attention, while the interior of the house, particularly the meticulously cleaned bathroom, sparked heightened suspicion. Huntley's immaculate cleaning efforts were noted, except for a newly discovered crack in the bathtub enamel, contrasting with its recent pristine condition. When questioned about this discrepancy, Huntley attributed a mess in the dining room, supposedly due to a recent flood. Detectives noticed Huntley's agitation during this particular discussion. Moreover, his subsequent weight loss and evident signs of sleeplessness in the following weeks added to the growing list of observations surrounding his behaviour. The subsequent day, Huntley embarked on a journey from Soham to Grimsby to retrieve his girlfriend. During this rendezvous, a neighbour near Maxine's mother's residence observed an interaction between the couple by the car's boot. Recounting the incident to authorities, the witness described Huntley appearing visibly shaken and pale while gazing at the boot for a brief period. Maxine stood behind him, her demeanour sombre with a bowed head and tears streaming down her face. As Huntley caught sight of the neighbour, he abruptly slammed the boot shut, signalling an abrupt end to their encounter. Throughout the search efforts for the missing schoolgirls, Huntley actively participated. However, his interactions with the police raised suspicions. He frequently inquired about the progress of the investigation and showed an unusual interest in the longevity of forensic evidence. During a conversation with an officer, three notable scratches, each about three centimetres in length, were observed on Huntley's jaw. When asked about the origin of these scratches, he attributed them to his dog, providing this explanation upon inquiry. On August 15th, Huntley was interviewed by Sky News, as he was the last known person to have had contact with Holly and Jessica prior to their disappearances. He said, quote, I don't know the girls. I was stood on the front doorstep grooming my dog down. She'd run away and come back a bit of a mess. They just came across and asked how she was. 
I just said she weren't very good as she hadn't got the job and they just says, please tell her that we're very sorry, and off they walked, in the direction of the library over there. During the interview, Huntley, like other residents, expressed holding on to a glimmer of hope for the safe return of the girls, despite his knowledge that their return was improbable. However, suspicions didn't solely centre on Ian, as his girlfriend, Maxine Carr, also came under scrutiny. In an interview where Carr proudly exhibited a card crafted by Holly on her final day at their former school, she inadvertently referred to Holly in the past tense, stating, quote, She was just lovely, really lovely. This choice of past tense raised additional concerns about her involvement or knowledge of the girls' fate. The following day, both Huntley and Carr underwent extensive questioning sessions, each lasting approximately seven hours, culminating in their relocation to a safe house. Initially, Carr asserted that she had been at home on the night the girls disappeared. However, several witnesses placed her in Grimsby, where her mother resided during that time, contradicting her alibi. Simultaneously, law enforcement discovered Huntley's past involvement in a sexual assault accusation a few years prior involving an 18-year-old woman. This prior incident heightened suspicions surrounding his involvement in the current case. Additionally, records revealed Huntley's history of relationships with at least three underage girls, including impregnating a 15-year-old. Moreover, further allegations surfaced as other young women came forward, alleging Huntley's assault, notably an 11-year-old girl to which he later confessed. These revelations significantly intensified concerns about Huntley's character and potential involvement in the girls' disappearance. That very night, while Huntley and Carr were sequestered at the safe house, the police initiated a thorough search of their residence on College Close and meticulously combed the grounds of Soham Village College, where Huntley was employed, in hopes of discovering any incriminating evidence. Their painstaking efforts did yield results. The conspicuously immaculate state of the house raised suspicions of foul play. Several items of significance were unearthed on the property. However, the most damning evidence emerged from the trash cans in a hangar within the college grounds linked to Ian Huntley's work, an utterly damning discovery. The charred remains of the Manchester United t-shirts worn by Jessica and Holly on the day of their disappearance. This critical finding significantly implicated Huntley in the girls' disappearance. The investigation intensified as forensic examinations revealed compelling evidence linking Ian Huntley to the heinous crime. Fibres from the girl's charred t-shirts were discovered on Huntley's body and clothing, while his fingerprints were identified on the bin holding the burnt clothing. Huntley's Ford Fiesta underwent forensic scrutiny, mirroring the pattern seen in his property, meticulously cleaned, Traces of brick dust, chalk and concrete were detected on the foot pedals and wheel arches, identical to the materials found along the road leading to the location where the girls' bodies were discovered. Moreover, alterations to the car, such as the removal of a rear seat cover and the felt lining of the boot, raised additional suspicions. The pivotal moment in the case arrived at 4.30am on August the 17th, marking a significant turning point in the case, as both Ian Huntley and Maxine Carr were arrested on charges of suspicion of abduction and murder. This marked a critical milestone in the investigation, with the accumulation of substantial evidence leading to their apprehension. On August 17th, 2002, a grim and tragic discovery shook the nation as the bodies of Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman were found lying side by side in a five feet deep ditch. The scene was unearthed around 12.30pm by a gamekeeper near a pheasant enclosure adjacent to the perimeter fence of RAF Lakenheath in Suffolk, approximately 10 miles east of Soham. The gamekeeper, who had previously detected an unsettling odour emanating from the area in preceding days, opted to explore the vicinity on that fateful day, accompanied by two associates. Upon making the harrowing discovery, they promptly alerted the authorities, sparking a wave of shock and grief across the country. 
The devastating state of the bodies, significantly decomposed and subjected to an apparent attempt at incineration to obliterate forensic evidence, posed a significant challenge for forensic pathologists. Despite the absence of formal identification at this preliminary stage, strands of hair discovered on nearby tree branches were identified as belonging to Jessica Chapman. It wasn't until August 21st that DNA testing conclusively confirmed the identities of the deceased as Jessica Chapman and Holly Wells. An inquest conducted into their deaths concluded that the probable cause was asphyxiation, although definitive confirmation was hindered by the advanced stages of decomposition. Determining whether sexual assault had occurred remained inconclusive. Notably, the girls had not succumbed to death at the location where their remains were found, indicating they were killed elsewhere, with evidence suggesting that they were buried there within 24 hours of their deaths. The timeline was approximated through forensic analysis of nettle shoots. The advancements in forensic science and DNA analysis by 2002 standards significantly aided the investigation, allowing for crucial identifications and insights that would have been unimaginable in previous decades, showcasing the significant progress made in forensic techniques over time. Ian Huntley adopted a strategy of silence and evasiveness during his time in custody, attempting to avoid scrutiny and serious consequences for his actions. He even resorted to feigning mental illness to escape accountability. However, psychiatric evaluations concluded that he was mentally competent to stand trial. In contrast, Maxine Carr openly admitted to fabricating her initial alibi, acknowledging that she was not home on the night the girls vanished, but rather staying with her mother in Grimsby. During a phone conversation with Carr, Huntley recounted a version of events where he claimed to have seen the girls at their house before they disappeared, mentioning Holly's apparent nosebleed and Jessica's assistance in helping Holly clean up. He then asserted that the girls departed the house. Expressing concerns about potential repercussions from his previous sexual assault allegations, Huntley confided in Carr about suffering a nervous breakdown following his earlier arrest. Influenced by Huntley's narrative and emotional manipulation, Carr aligned her account with his version of events. Despite mounting evidence against her boyfriend, Carr remained emotionally loyal and staunchly defended Huntley's innocence to the police, vehemently asserting that he could not have committed such a heinous crime. On August the 20th, the authorities accumulated ample evidence to formally charge Ian Huntley with two counts of murder, while Maxine Carr faced charges of perverting the course of justice and two counts of assisting an offender. While awaiting trial, Huntley made a suicide attempt by overdosing on antidepressants, which ultimately proved unsuccessful. After his time at Woodhill Prison in Milton Keynes, he was subsequently transferred to Belmarsh Prison, located in London. During the preliminary hearing, Huntley entered a plea of not guilty to the charges of murder, but admitted guilt to the charge of conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. Conversely, Carr pleaded not guilty to charges of attempting to pervert the course of justice and assisting an offender. These legal developments set the stage for a complex and emotionally charged trial. The trial commenced on November 5th, 2003 at London's Old Bailey, where the prosecution painted a disturbing picture of events. The prosecutor presented the theory that Huntley intentionally enticed the girls to his home around 6.37pm that evening, possibly using Maxine's presence, a person both girls liked, as bait. The prosecution alleged that he subsequently murdered them shortly afterwards. This timeline was supported by cell phone data revealing Jessica's Nokia mobile phone being switched off at 6.46pm in the vicinity of Huntley's residence. The location where the girls' bodies were found held significance to Huntley, a site frequented due to his interest in plane spotting. His attempt to burn their bodies failed due to damp ground conditions. The weight of forensic evidence, including blood spatter traces discovered on the walls of the hallway and master bedroom of Huntley's residence, served as compelling indications of his involvement. 
Despite Huntley's claims of accidental deaths, his explanations were widely disbelieved. As Richard Latham QC succinctly put it, quote, Ten-year-old girls don't just drop dead. The accumulation of evidence during the trial painted a damning picture, and the jury saw through Huntley's deceitful accounts. During the defence's presentation to the court, Ian Huntley admitted to the deaths of both girls occurring in his home, but vehemently denied any intentional harm. He alleged that Holly Wells entered his bathroom to tend to a nosebleed while the bath was filled with water, apparently for his dog's bath. According to Huntley's account, he slipped, causing Holly to fall into the bath and drowned accidentally. He claimed to have been paralysed by panic as Jessica began screaming. In his version of events, he admitted to unintentionally strangling Jessica in an attempt to silence her screams, resulting in her accidental death. When questioned about his failure to seek emergency assistance and instead attempting to conceal the events, Huntley asserted that he believed no one would accept the deaths as accidental. He also stated that his pretense of mental illness was actually a reaction to trauma, causing temporary amnesia due to the distress from the children's deaths. This defence narrative aimed to portray the deaths as tragic accidents, and Huntley's subsequent actions as responses rooted in fear and disbelief, rather than intentional harm. During her testimony, Maxine Carr admitted to fabricating falsehoods in an attempt to shield Ian Huntley, who repeatedly asserted his innocence to her. Carr openly confessed to lying to protect Huntley, emphasising that had she been aware of his guilt, she would not have intervened or supported him in any way. Her testimony sought to convey that her actions were driven by a belief in Huntley's innocence rather than any deliberate intention to cover up or protect someone she knew to be guilty. In his concluding remarks, Mr Justice Moses suggested that the underlying motive behind the crime was likely of a sexual nature, but had gone awry. The jury began deliberations on December 12th, and after four days, on December 17th, they returned with a majority guilty verdict against Ian Huntley for the murders of Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman. Subsequently, Huntley received a life sentence with a minimum term of 40 years, implying he would be ineligible for parole until 2042. Maxine Carr was acquitted of the charge of assisting an offender as the jury accepted that she genuinely believed in Ian Huntley's innocence until his arrest. However, she received a three and a half year sentence for perverting the course of justice. Following her release from prison after serving just 21 months, she was granted a new identity and lives under anonymity. This measure was taken to protect her safety and privacy, allowing her to lead a life shielded from public scrutiny. Mr Justice Alan Moses told the court during Huntley's sentencing, quote, Your tears have never been for them, only for yourself. In your attempts to escape responsibility, in your lies and manipulation, you have increased the suffering of two families. There is no greater task for the criminal justice system than to protect the vulnerable. There are few worse crimes than your murder of these two young girls. Leslie Chapman, Jessica's father, spoke to the public following the conviction and spoke of Huntley's mindset. Quote, I think he was a time bomb waiting to go off and both our girls were in the wrong place at the wrong time. I hope the next time I see him, it will be like we saw our daughters and it will be in a coffin. The tragic deaths of Holly and Jessica had a profound impact, not only on their families and friends, but also on the entire community. Their heartbreaking story deeply affected the nation. In September 2002, both girls were laid to rest after private funeral services held at St Andrew's Church in their hometown of Soham. They were interred side by side at Fordham Road Cemetery, resting together in eternal peace.
On April 2nd, 2008, a 22-year-old from Melbourne, Australia, vanished in the dark of night under very murky and mysterious circumstances. Despite numerous lingering questions, this perplexing case has garnered very little media attention. Described by a friend as a gorgeous girl with an infectious laugh and a caring, kindest, most trusting nature, Ji Wan Chong, affectionately known as Sally Chong, was cherished deeply by her family and friends. A passionate shutterbug, she found joy in capturing candid moments through her lens. Despite her popularity and willingness to aid those in need, Sally was known for her timidity, often keeping her opinions and much of her personal life discreet, particularly in the realm of relationships. Despite this secrecy, she played a pivotal role as a translator for her family and was looked up to by her siblings. In the suburban landscape of Melbourne, Sally's formative years unfolded in a bustling household of nine, encompassing her parents, grandparents and four younger siblings, Helen, Anna, Andrew and Wendy. Described by her sister Helen, their upbringing followed a familiar pattern, with parents who instilled the values of hard work, active participation in the family's Asian food wholesale business and a deep-seated respect for their elders. During her teenage years, Sally pursued her education at the Presbyterian Ladies' College in nearby Burwood, later venturing into the realm of computer science at university. In 2007, post-graduation, Sally embarked on a year-long journey to Beijing, China, primarily driven by the aspiration to enhance her language proficiency and forge new connections. Despite being deeply tied to her birthplace, Sally returned to Australia in early 2008, and her demeanour, according to her loved ones, underwent a subtle transformation. Helen, her sister, shared with the media that Sally had expressed an unusual desire for more freedom, a departure from her usual role as a family-oriented homebody. Having just returned from experiencing a different country, it's conceivable that Sally, fueled by her time in China, yearned to explore more of the world beyond the familiar confines of the Melbourne suburbs where she grew up. Notably, reports surfaced about Sally's undisclosed relationship during her gap year in China. Despite the Chong family possessing photos of Sally with her partner, little was known about him. This revelation underscores Sally's penchant for keeping much of her life private and raises the intriguing possibility that she may have harboured a desire to carve out a life beyond the confines of her Melbourne suburban upbringing. In 2008, at the age of 22, Sally found herself employed in the family business, a pragmatic choice to sustain herself as opportunities in her field of computer science were elusive at the time. Residing at her family home on Moresby Street in Oakley South, Victoria, Sally navigated the intricacies of balancing work and home life. On the 1st of April 2008, Sally spent the day engaged in family activities, playing tennis and sharing dinner with her loved ones. She retired to her room earlier than usual, around 9pm, after what seemed to be a remarkably ordinary day with no apparent concerns on her mind. At around 10pm, Sally's father, returning from a business trip to Adelaide, quietly entered her room to leave the keys to the family's cargo van. However, at this hour, approximately 11pm, Sally was already asleep. Her father, noticing the unusual circumstance that her door was shut, found it noteworthy as Sally typically left her door slightly ajar, mirroring the nighttime routine of all the children in the household. In the early hours of April 2nd, around 3am, Wendy Chong, Sally's 14-year-old sister, was immersed in a late-night MSN chat with her boyfriend when she detected an unusual noise. Initially attributing it to their mother, Wendy feigned sleep to avoid any potential repercussions for being up so late. However, after a few moments, curiosity got the better of her, 
prompting Wendy to check the hallway outside her room. To her surprise, she encountered a dark silhouette, a mysterious figure lingering near her sister Helen's room before moving towards Sally's bedroom. Intriguingly, Wendy then caught the murmur of a man's low voice, a simple utterance of the word, yeah. Assuming it was Sally's boyfriend, a familiar visitor during the early hours, someone Sally had met after her return from China, a former schoolmate now working as a doctor, Wendy dismissed any further concern. Subsequently, she observed Sally walking down the hall, presumably returning from the bathroom. With this, Wendy returned to bed and drifted off to sleep around 3.30am, unaware that this would be the last time she saw her sister alive. Later that morning, around 7.30am, Sally's father arose for work as part of his routine, only to be confronted by an unusual sight just outside his bedroom door. On the floor lay the keys to his BMW and the keys to his business premises. His immediate assumption was that Sally had left them there, as she would have been the last person to have used the keys. Believing she was still asleep, he presumed nothing out of the ordinary at that moment. Around 9am, Andrew, Sally's brother, received a call instructing him to request Sally to bring their father's mobile phone to work in Keysborough, as he had forgotten it. However, upon searching the house, Andrew couldn't locate his sister and assumed that she had already left for work. Andrew then passed the responsibility to his sister, Anna, who proceeded to text Helen to inquire about Sally's whereabouts. Helen, unaware of Sally's location, presumed she might be with her boyfriend. Around 1pm, the Chong family came to the unsettling realisation that nobody had seen or heard from Sally since the previous night, including her boyfriend, who confirmed he hadn't been with her and hadn't received any communication from her that day. Sally's absence at her workplace, a significant departure from her routine, raised a red flag for her family. It's worth noting that Melbourne residents were grappling with the aftermath of a severe windstorm wreaking havoc across the city, potentially affecting Sally's commute to work. Despite their growing concern, Sally's parents faced a bureaucratic hurdle at the police station. Regulations prevented them from officially reporting Sally as missing until 24 hours had elapsed. This delay added to the family's distress as they grappled with the mysterious disappearance of young Sally. In an anxious state of waiting, Sally's family undertook a thorough search of her bedroom, hoping to find any potential clues to her whereabouts. They meticulously examined her belongings, accessed her Facebook account and reached out to her close friends those with whom she often spent time, in an attempt to glean any information about her recent activities. Unfortunately, their efforts yielded no results. Driven by their mounting concern, the family extended their search beyond the home, driving through the neighbourhood in hopes of finding any trace of the 22-year-old. Despite their exhaustive efforts, there was still no sign of Sally, intensifying the mystery surrounding her disappearance. Extensive police and forensic investigations delved into every corner of the Chong residence, yet no significant clues emerged to shed light on Sally's disappearance. The thorough search yielded no traces of blood or indications of a struggle within the premises. However, Sally's family did manage to ascertain that she had taken her wallet, phone, iPod, car keys and a distinctive blue security blanket, a rather unusual item to bring along, according to her sister. This blanket held sentimental value for Sally, having been a cherished possession since childhood. Notably, despite taking her car keys, Sally did not take her car, passport or camera, items she typically carried everywhere. An intriguing detail emerged when Helen informed authorities that Sally's mobile phone and the landline in her room had rung several times the night before her disappearance, specifically between 10.30 and 11pm. 
Strikingly, all calls went unanswered, including those from her boyfriend who was returning an earlier call from Sally. The reasons behind Sally's lack of response remains a perplexing mystery. On March the 3rd, 2008, less than a month before her disappearance, police discovered a concerning email conversation between Sally and a male friend. In the correspondence, she shared a startling detail with detectives, expressing a fear for her life. She conveyed to this male friend, quote, I'm afraid you gun me down or get angry, revealing a deep-seated fear that this individual might resort to violence, including the possibility of shooting her. Police diligently interviewed the male individual mentioned, along with two other males identified in various sources as Sally's ex-boyfriends. Despite initial suspicions, all three were ruled out as suspects due to their solid alibis and the outcomes of polygraph tests. It's important to note that while polygraph tests are not admissible as evidence in court, they were instrumental in eliminating these individuals from this list of potential suspects. Detectives went to great lengths, travelling across Australia to question associates and connections of Sally's, hoping to uncover any leads or information that could provide insight into her vanishing. Unfortunately, these efforts did not yield any significant findings. The media reports on this case do not provide clear information about whether the police positively identified the male individual present in the Chong residence on the night Sally disappeared. Sally's trusting nature, as described by friends, adds a layer of complexity to the investigation. Some friends believe that Sally, in her trusting demeanour, tended to give everyone she met the benefit of the doubt. It's plausible that Sally, known for her openness, may have encountered someone during her travels whom she befriended, but who harboured ill intentions. Her confidences to a female friend revealed a nuanced emotional landscape, expressing a constant need for a boyfriend. Despite her positive feelings for the Melbourne doctor she was dating, Sally admitted to still harbouring emotions for a love interest back in China. These emotional complexities may have played a role in her interactions and relationships, adding further intricacy to the investigation into her disappearance. The initial belief held by Sally's family, considering the possibility that she may have run away, has been clouded by the lack of any contact from her since her disappearance. Notably, there has been no activity in her bank account since that time, and her phone, a crucial link to her daily life, has remained untouched. An intriguing detail emerges concerning her phone, which was switched off around 11am on the day she vanished. Prior to having been turned off, several attempts were made to contact her, resulting in strange crackling noises rather than hearing a human voice. The fate of Sally, who was on the brink of turning 23 when she disappeared, remains shrouded in uncertainty. Despite the exhaustive efforts of her parents, including hiring private investigators and consulting psychics who offered conflicting insights, no concrete leads have emerged. Some psychics suggested that Sally was alive and residing in China, even though she didn't take her passport, leading to speculation about the possibility of obtaining fake identification. The fact that Sally took her security blanket with her raises the likelihood that she may have left willingly, possibly with assistance from someone else. However, the truth behind her disappearance remains elusive. Sally's passing comment about the strict curfews imposed by her parents hints at potential tensions and a desire for more freedom. It raises the possibility that her need for independence was more profound than a passing thought, suggesting that she might have been deeply unhappy and in desperate need of a significant change in her life. The Chong family, like many in Asian cultures, had a dynamic where the eldest sibling often assumed a third parental role, a responsibility that might not have been to Sally's liking. 
With her parents heavily involved in their work, Sally found herself spending a significant amount of time caring for her younger sisters and brother. She took on various parental duties, from driving her siblings to and from after-school activities to organising their tuition. She even played a role in getting them dressed in the morning and ready for bed most nights. This level of responsibility and expectations associated with meeting her parents' standards could have placed immense pressure on Sally. The idea of fulfilling the role of a parental figure to her siblings, coupled with striving to excel in every aspect of her life, might have become overwhelming. Helen, Sally's sister, shared with one source that whenever she and her siblings needed something, their mother's frequent response was simply, ask Sally. The enduring mystery surrounding Sally Chong's disappearance, now 15 years unresolved, leaves authorities and her family grappling with various possibilities. The lack of significant leads has kept the case in a state of ambiguity. The uncertainties persist as to whether Sally chose to disappear voluntarily, seeking a new life, or if she met with a tragic fate. The passage of time adds complexity to the investigation, and despite ongoing efforts, the circumstances surrounding Sally's vanishing remain elusive. The Chong family, as well as those involved in the search for answers, continue to endure the heartache of not knowing what transpired on that fateful night. When she disappeared in April of 2008, Sally Chong was 22 years old. She is described as being of Asian origin, specifically Chinese, with a tanned complexion. She is of a slim build, standing at 5 feet 3 inches tall. She had long brown hair and brown eyes. Unfortunately, it's unknown what Sally was last seen wearing. Due to the circumstances involved, Sally Chong is classed as an endangered missing person. Those with any information regarding the disappearance of Sally Chong are urged to contact Australian Crime Stoppers on 1800 000. On February 21st of 2020, in a forest clearing near Flagstaff, Arizona, 27-year-old Sasha Krauss was found lying face down amid foliage, having been victim of a gunshot wound to the back of her head. This discovery unfolded after the Sunday school teacher had vanished over a month prior from a Mennonite community located almost 400 miles away in New Mexico. On the 8th of April 1992, in Temple, Texas, Robert and Laura Krause welcomed their daughter, Sasha Marie Krause, into the world. The couple also had six other children, Amanda, Evelyn, Emma, Megan, Robert and Sarah. At 11 years old, Sasha joined the Mennonite church alongside her parents. The Mennonite Church is a Christian denomination tracing its roots to the 16th century Anabaptist movement. It has evolved into a diverse and globally dispersed community. Named after Menno Simons, a key leader in the early movement, Mennonites are known for their distinctive beliefs and practices. Central to their faith is the principle of believer's baptism, where individuals make a personal choice to be baptised once they can express a conscious commitment to their faith. The Mennonite Church places a strong emphasis on peace, non-resistance, pacifism and community, often opting for a simple and communal way of life. This commitment to non-violence has led many Mennonites to avoid military service and actively engage in humanitarian and social justice initiatives. Over the centuries, various branches and groups within the Mennonite tradition have emerged, ranging from more conservative to liberal, each adapting to the cultural contexts in which they reside. Today, Mennonite communities are found globally, reflecting a rich tapestry of beliefs, practices and contributions to the broader Christian landscape. 
Sasha was committed to her faith and the church, and often wrote poems and lyrics to hymns. She spent six years teaching others at Grandview Gospel Fellowship. Eighteen months prior to her passing, she relocated to Farmington, New Mexico. Farmington is nestled in the northwest part of the state and is characterised by its picturesque surroundings and a blend of urban and rural elements. The city sits against the stunning backdrop of the San Juan River and enjoys a mix of high desert landscapes and mesas. Known for its vibrant cultural scene, Farmington hosts events that celebrate Native American traditions and art. The wilderness offers unique geological formations, attracting many outdoor enthusiasts. Farmington also serves as a hub for exploring the Four Corners region and is appreciated for its outdoor recreational opportunities, including hiking, fishing and exploring archaeological sites. There, Sasha commenced her employment at Lamp and Light Publishers. She played a crucial role in the literature ministry, contributing significantly to outreach efforts in Spanish, French and English. During the evening of January 18th, 2020, Sasha went out to run an errand for the Farmington Mennonite Church, where she was to collect books to teach for Sunday school the following morning. Sasha had dinner with her roommates at their residence in Farmington and then travelled on a short journey by car to the church. She would never be seen alive again. Failing to return home, her roommates reported her as a missing person. Investigators arrived on the scene and searched the church and the surrounding grounds to no avail. However, a strange discovery was made in Sasha's car, a silver Ford Focus. The car keys were found between the door and the passenger seat. Her disappearance was strongly out of character, as she was known to have been a sensible individual and she didn't express any desire to leave Farmington of her own accord. She had left many of her personal belongings at her residence, as she only intended to grab the books from the church and return home soon afterwards. For police, it was an obvious case of foul play. She had taken her cell phone with her, therefore investigators managed to search through the device's tracking history. Initial investigations showed that Sasha had departed from Farmington and headed to the Four Corners. The Four Corners region is a unique geographical area where the borders of four states intersect – Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico and Utah. This distinctive point is marked by a concrete monument, and it is the only point in the United States where the boundaries of four states meet at a single point. Once Sasha had reached this point, her cell phone was subsequently switched off, providing authorities with no further tracking information. $50,000 was offered for any information leading to the whereabouts of Sasha Krause. Witnesses reported seeing a white SUV driving out of Farmington around the time that Sasha disappeared, however police were unable to confirm their sightings with evidence. On February 21st, five weeks following her unexplained vanishing and over 300 miles from her secluded Mennonite community, Sasha Krause's remains were located by hikers who notified the San Juan County Sheriff's Office in Flagstaff, Arizona. Her lifeless body was stumbled upon by a camper collecting firewood, who observed something white amid the black volcanic cinders and dry pine needles on the ground. Distraught and trembling, the camper hastily drove to a nearby visitor centre, tearfully recounting to the staff that she had come across legs and shoes. Authorities found Sasha's body discarded near a makeshift campsite, her wrists tightly bound with duct tape in proximity to Sunset Crater National Monument. She was clad in a grey dress, a white coat and hiking shoes, her hair neatly pinned in a bun. 
Her undergarments were notably absent, however, there were no signs of sexual assault. The autopsy disclosed no defensive wounds, but there was evidence of blunt force trauma and a fractured skull. Her demise unfolded in an execution-style manner, marked by a gunshot wound to the back of her head, the bullet of which was determined to have come from a 22 caliber rifle. She had been deceased for quite some time when her body was discovered. There was no evidence found in or around the area to suggest who had committed such a heinous act or their motive for doing so. As the investigation into her death began, Sasha was laid to rest in Itasca, her family's hometown, on the 28th of February. Investigators focused once again on her cell phone and its data, pushing their efforts towards analysing information picked up by the surrounding cell phone towers in Farmington, Four Corners and Sunset Crater. After hours of checking the data, it was discovered that a single phone number pinged in these areas at the time Sasha vanished. They were able to trace the number of the cell phone to a man who instantly became a suspect in Sasha's murder. 21-year-old Mark Gooch was an airman first class who served as an Air Force mechanic and was stationed at Luke Air Force Base in Phoenix, Arizona. He seemed to live an ordinary life and had no criminal history. Growing up in a Mennonite household in Wisconsin, Mark Gooch enlisted in the military as a means of breaking free from what he conveyed to investigators as a challenging, sheltered and constrained existence, as documented in sheriff's records. Expressing a sense of detachment, Mark conveyed that he felt like an outsider due to not being born into the family's religious beliefs. He confided in a friend, expressing a sentiment of finding life on his family's organic dairy farm disheartening, and expressing a desire to experience a lifestyle more akin to that of others. He had no connection to Sasha, other than the fact that they had both experienced the Mennonite faith during their lives. In 2020, Mark had a seething hatred for the Mennonites. Falling under the scope of suspicion, authorities visited Mark at the Luke Air Force Base, where they questioned him. When officials interviewed Gooch at the base, he initially believed the inquiry revolved around speeding on his motorcycle. Coconino County Sheriff's Detective Lauren Jones inquired about his recent travels, family background and church involvement during the 75-minute interview. Towards the conclusion, she posed a direct question. Did you abduct Sasha Krauss? He denied this and was subsequently asked, did you kill Sasha Krauss? He responded, no, ma'am. According to Mark's older brother, Sam Gooch, he mentioned that he and his siblings harboured resentment towards the Mennonite community due to perceived mistreatment, although he did not provide further details. Sam was suspected to have collected the rifle used in the killing, however, he was released without charge. A pivotal piece of evidence found was a text message conversation between the two brothers, where Mark explicitly mentioned keeping a vigilant watch on members of the Mennonite community in Farmington, just days before Sasha Krause's disappearance. Another brother, Jacob, was also the focus of a separate criminal investigation, which, according to media reports, was not connected to the murder of Sasha Kraus. It is unclear in reports, however, one of the older Gooch siblings attended Bible school in Texas, notably the same school that Sasha herself attended. This sibling also reportedly had dinner at the Krauss family home on at least one occasion. Mark Gooch admitted to journeying to Farmington, New Mexico on January the 18th, the day Sasha vanished, stating he was taking a long drive. Departing the Luke Air Force Base early that Saturday morning, he travelled north, passing through Flagstaff's snow-capped mountains and the Navajo Reservation. 
Along the way, he made stops for both food and gas in Farmington. He explained that his plan was to go to the Mennonite church, alleging that he wanted to seek faith and attend services. He said he didn't manage to check when the next services would be, however, he then returned to the Air Force base. Detectives noted discrepancies in Mark's account. Cell phone records suggested that he had spent a few hours near the church and in the forest outside Flagstaff, Arizona, after midnight. Surveillance footage at the Air Force Base revealed that he returned by car around 7am, the day after he departed. Mark claimed he believed it was no later than 2am. Investigators' suspicion grew further when a receipt was found which indicated that Mark had his car detailed the day after Sasha's body was discovered. Mark was subsequently charged with the murder of Sasha Krause, with the trial commencing in September of 2021. 22-year-old Mark Gooch pleaded not guilty to the charges of abduction and first-degree murder, having refused to testify during the trial. The jury examined all the evidence and returned with a guilty verdict. He was sentenced to life imprisonment, showing no emotion or remorse for his actions. Prior to his sentencing, he stated to the court, Firstly, I'd like to express my sincere condolences to the deceased's family, and also, I'd like to express my thankfulness for the love and support from my own family in this difficult situation. Mark's motives for killing Sasha remain a mystery, with no explanation given as to why he specifically targeted the 27-year-old. Despite claiming his childhood was difficult, having experienced life with the Mennonite faith, it seemed to many that this alone was not enough of a reason to brutally kill an innocent woman. Sasha's untimely departure left a void that could never be filled, but her memory will forever live on in the hearts of her loved ones, who will remember her for her compassionate spirit, unwavering faith and dedication to her community. Arriving into the world on July 4th, 1996, Tika Latrade Lewis was characterised as a loving and caring individual. Despite her affectionate nature, she tended to be reserved and shy during her infancy and early childhood. Tika shared her formative years with her mother, Teresa English, and four siblings in Tacoma, Washington. Notably, her father, Robert, was incarcerated at that time, serving a four-year sentence for theft. Beyond her immediate family, Tika had limited interactions with her extended family and was notably reserved around them. Teresa, her mother, shared with the Seattle Times that Tika would often cry when her aunts and uncles tried to pick her up. Meeting strangers or individuals she wasn't very familiar with posed a challenge for the shy and cautious young girl. Her mother said, quote, She wouldn't go outside on her own. She's a mama's girl. She sleeps with me and her blankie, and if I'm not there, she's crying, and if she doesn't have her blankie, she's crying. On the evening of January 23rd, 1999, two-year-old Tika enjoyed her time bowling with various family members at the New Frontier Lanes on Centre Street in Tacoma, Washington. Given that it was a Saturday night, the alley bustled with activity and the parking lot was nearly at full capacity. The Bowling Alley's League Night, a popular community event held every weekend, drew a considerable crowd. Tika and her family gathered at lanes 7 and 8, situated near the centre of the bowling alley. While her family engaged in the games, Tika freely roamed between the lanes and the arcade area. She indulged in various games, including a coin-operated claw machine with the assistance of her uncle who helped her win a teddy bear, a gift she generously presented to her baby sister. 
Throughout the night, Tika used quarters from her purse to enjoy multiple arcade games, savouring her favourite sweets, starbursts, as she played. Between 10 and 10.15pm, Tika was engrossed in playing a race car video game called Cruisin' World, in the arcade section of the bowling alley, mere feet away from her family and the exit. In a momentary lapse, Tika's mother turned away from her daughter for no more than 15 seconds to attend to one of her other children. Upon turning back, she was met with the startling realisation that Tika had seemingly vanished into thin air. Initially, Teresa entertained the possibility that Tika was playing hide-and-seek, but as minutes passed without finding her, panic gripped her. In a frantic effort, Teresa, along with her family, engaged on-duty security and staff members in scouring every corner of the bowling alley. Despite their combined efforts, there was no sign of the two-year-old. The official report of Tika's disappearance was filed at 10.30pm. Police promptly arrived on the scene and conducted a thorough search both inside and outside the premises, yielding no results. While authorities initially considered the notion that Tika may have wandered off, the growing passage of time raised the disturbing possibility that she might have been abducted by unknown individuals. Subsequently, the FBI and the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children, also known as the NCMEC, joined the intensive search for Tika. Search teams were mobilised both on the ground and in the air to cover wooded areas, open water and other possible locations. Helicopters equipped with infrared cameras scoured the vicinity, searching for any signs of life. Additionally, authorities enlisted the assistance of search dogs to comb through various areas. Three days after Tika's disappearance, a discovery intensified the investigation. A pile of men's clothing, neatly rolled into a ball, was found concealed under a bush directly across the street from the bowling alley. It was apparent that the clothing had not been there for an extended period, leading authorities to designate them as items of interest in relation to Tika's case. The clothing included a navy blue wool peacoat with the initials IS or JS on the back label, off-white Lee brand jeans and a Columbia brand button-down plaid shirt. At first, Teresa harboured suspicions towards another woman present at the bowling alley that evening. She vividly remembered this individual asking to hold a relative's baby and exhibiting what she perceived as odd behaviour. Despite Teresa's initial hunch, investigators, upon thorough investigation, concluded that the woman was not connected to the potential abduction. Nonetheless, investigators underscored their commitment to scrutinising anyone who was in or around the bowling alley during that time. Eyewitnesses reported the sighting of a maroon-coloured Pontiac Grand Am speeding away from the parking lot of the bowling alley on the night in question. The vehicle was described as potentially a three- or four-door model belonging to the late 80s or early 90s, featuring tinted windows and a conspicuous large spoiler. This information became a critical lead in the investigation, prompting authorities to delve into the details of this distinctive vehicle as they sought to unravel the circumstances surrounding Tika's disappearance. Another witness came forward, reporting the sighting of a Caucasian male aged in his 30s or 40s, standing at approximately 5 feet 11 inches. The individual had shoulder-length brown hair, a moustache, a prominent nose and noticeable pockmarks on his face. This witness observed the man hastily following a mixed-race child from the restrooms toward one of the exits of the bowling alley on the night Tika disappeared. It remains unclear whether this person was directly involved in her disappearance. The police described the man as wearing a checked flannel shirt and faded blue jeans, providing additional details to aid their investigation. Rather disturbingly, the disappearance of Tika Lewis wasn't the only frightening incident that occurred within the confines of the bowling alley in recent months. 
Two months to Tika vanishing, in November of 1998, a four-year-old boy was sexually assaulted in the bathroom by a man with curly brown hair and a beard, possibly wearing a hat depicting the word husky on the front, possibly a link to the huskies team at the nearby University of Washington. According to the alley's security team, they had seen a man who matched the description of the mysterious offender on several other occasions, but they didn't know who he was. In the aftermath of Tika's abduction, a disturbingly similar incident unfolded within a few weeks. A Caucasian man with brown hair attempted to lure a six-year-old boy from the same bowling alley, falsely claiming to be the boy's father. Shockingly, just hours before Tika's disappearance, at approximately 2pm, two children playing in the nearby Oakland Madrona Park narrowly escaped abduction. A man with curly brown hair wearing a baseball cap tried to take them from the park toilets. Fortunately, their father intervened, chasing the suspect away. He vividly recalled the perpetrator fleeing in a blue 1995 Pontiac Grand Am vehicle. The attempted abduction was reported to the police three days later on January 26th, prompted by the children's father learning about Tika's disappearance. These alarming parallels raised concerns and added complexity to the ongoing investigation. The fate of the man matching the description and his vehicle concerning Tika Lewis's disappearance and the other attempted kidnappings remains unclear as there is no information indicating whether they were ever found or questioned in connection to these incidents. The potential relationship between the abductions remains uncertain, although the similarities suggest a possible connection. Unfortunately, the availability and usefulness of CCTV footage in this case are unclear, adding an additional layer of complexity to the case. Tika hated to interact with strangers, which makes her abduction all the more bizarre. She was also scared of the dark, and never liked to be separated from her mother. How was she lured away by a stranger and unnoticed remains somewhat of a mystery. Several individuals were looked into in regards to having possibly been involved, but police couldn't link any to the girl's disappearance. Given that Tika's father was imprisoned at the time of her disappearance, he was ruled out as a suspect in the case. The same applied to Tika's mother, Teresa, as authorities considered her initial demeanour during interactions with police. While she initially appeared calm, it is essential to recognise that people react differently to stress, and Teresa's composure might have been a result of shock. Authorities couldn't discern any motive for Teresa to be involved in such a heinous act against her own child, leading to her swift exclusion as a suspect. Teresa further solidified her innocence by passing two polygraph tests. In the course of the investigation, the family present at the bowling alley on the night of Tika's disappearance were also questioned by investigators. However, all members of the family were eventually ruled out as having any involvement in the incident. The search for Tika's abductor continued, with authorities exploring other leads and avenues in their pursuit of justice. Following Tika's disappearance, her family rallied behind the establishment of the Tika Lewis Bill in Washington State. This legislative initiative led to the formation of a Missing and Exploited Children's Task Force, empowering the Washington State Patrol to collaborate with local police in addressing missing child cases. Every year since Tika vanished, her family continued to hold memorials and vigils for her on her birthday and during the holidays. They still hold on to hope that Tika is out there somewhere, but may not know her true identity. To this day, Tika Lewis has never been found, nor her abductor been found or brought to justice. At the time of her disappearance in January 1999, Tika Lewis was two years old, described as being of African American, Caucasian and Native American origins, specifically Chippewa, standing at three feet tall and weighing approximately 35 pounds. Tika has black hair with natural red highlights and brown eyes. She has cheek dimples with some patches of discoloration on her face. 
Tika also has pierced ears and a large birthmark and eczema scarring on her left buttock. On the day she vanished, Tika was wearing a green Tweety Bird sweatshirt or t-shirt, a pair of white sweatpants and a pair of black and white Air Jordan sneakers. She had her hair pulled back into ponytails and was seen carrying a clear purse with a fish design containing starburst candies. It should be noted that Tika was asthmatic and used an inhaler. She may require medical attention. Lewis had received medical attention shortly prior to her disappearance at the Indian Health Practitioners in Puyallup, Washington, a clinic which specifically treats Native Americans across the US. Due to the circumstances, it is believed that foul play was involved in this case. Nobody has ever been arrested or held accountable in regards to Tika's disappearance. On the 25th anniversary of Tika's disappearance on January 23rd, 2024, family and friends held a vigil at the Tacoma Police Department to show support for one another and to bring awareness to the search for her. Despite the time that has passed, Tika has not been forgotten and her family continue to hope that someday she will be found. An age progression image was created by the NCMEC in 2013, depicting what Tika may look like at the age of 17, and the most recent age progression was released in 2022, depicting Tika at 26. If she is alive today, as of February 2024, 25 years after her disappearance, Tika Lewis would be 27 years old. If you have any information regarding this case which could be useful to the authorities, you can contact either Tacoma Police Department on 253-798-4721 or the FBI on 202-324-3000. Janet Henderson was born on the 22nd of November 1810 in Kinclaven, Perthshire, Scotland, to parents Andrew and Janet Henderson. Young Janet grew up in either Madderty or Aaron Tully before marrying a farm labourer named James Rogers in 1836. The couple then moved to the nearby village of Stanley in Perthshire before having three daughters, Anne, Janet and Margaret. Apart from being a farm labourer, Janet's husband, James, worked as a linen loom hand weaver before the family were relocated to Garth and then back to Kincleven, where another two daughters, Catherine and Mary, were born, finally settling in Aaron Tully. On the 13th of March, 1866, Janet, who was in her 50s by this point, travelled to her brother William Henderson's farm at Mount Stewart in Forgandenny, Perthshire. Janet, who was apparently a rather strong and muscular woman, went to help her brother on the farm, assisting with housekeeping and calving a cow. The previous female servant had recently left the farm, and whilst William was looking for a new one, Janet went to help her brother out while her husband James was away working on the Rohallian estate for a little while. Quite interestingly, almost every female servant William hired never lasted long. The reasons for this are allegedly that William made advances towards these women as he was actually unmarried and did not have children. That being said, his male servants didn't last long either. A few weeks into Janet's stay, on Friday the 30th of March 1866, 53-year-old William spent the day in Perth at a market, leaving Janet back at Mount Stewart Farm to carry out her usual day-to-day -day tasks. Something which struck William as odd when he returned to Mount Stewart later that day was the fact that the farmhouse was all locked up, which shouldn't have been the case since Janet should have been there to carry out various errands. Upon inquiring about his sister's whereabouts, William questioned another one of his servants, ploughman James Crichton, who told William that he hadn't seen Janet since around 11am. William feared for his sister and decided to climb up a ladder into one of the first floor bedrooms to search for Janet. He searched through the entire property, checking the bedrooms in case Janet was sleeping, but she wasn't there. 
William went into the kitchen and found a pile of bedclothes lying on the floor, but upon placing his hand underneath them slightly, he touched something deathly cold. It was a body. In a panic, William rushed to his closest neighbour, James Barless's home, for assistance. The two returned to the scene in the pitch black, lighting a candle as they entered the kitchen to inspect the body. Interestingly, the door key was missing, although it was later found when an outside cesspit was drained. William was left horrified when the pair lifted the blankets only to reveal the dead body of his sister, Janet Rogers, surrounded in a pool of her own blood, having been brutally bludgeoned to death with an axe. Who this axe belonged to remains a mystery. There aren't any sources to suggest the acts belong to William or anyone else within the household. Later that same night, William contacted the police, who were immediately dispatched to the farm, and William subsequently sent an urgent telegram to the procurator fiscal, Mr McLean. However, he was in Pitlochry investigating another case, so the telegram was then delivered to the assistant procurator fiscal, Mr John Young, at approximately 10.30pm. The telegram read as follows. Dear Sir, please come out here as soon as possible, as my sister has been murdered today while I was in Perth. Your obedient servant, William Henderson, Mount Stewart, Bridge of Earn. A local doctor also visited the scene as requested by William and confirmed that Janet had no pulse. But even more chillingly, Dr Lang told William that his sister had indeed been murdered. Upon arriving at the farm to investigate, police immediately suspected William as being the perpetrator in his sister's murder. However, authorities were quickly able to verify William's alibi, being that he was at a market in Perth all day for a business trip before going through Bridge of Erne and returning home at around 7pm. His story was confirmed by a number of witnesses, therefore he was ruled out as having any involvement in Janet's death. Police concluded that some sort of robbery had occurred, although there are not any sources which further elaborate on this, and it is not certain what items were taken from the farm. Janet's funeral took place on the 5th of April, 1866. However, quite bizarrely, no cause of death was listed on her death certificate. The reasons as to why is unknown. However, the doctor who examined her did state that she had, quote, injuries inflicted on the head by someone unknown. At the time, police offered a reward of £100 to find Janet's killer, which, bear in mind, was a lot of money back in the 1860s. This case received a lot of publicity because of this, but unfortunately, many people came forward with false statements simply because they wanted to claim the reward money. This was hugely frustrating for police, who were wasting valuable time and resources on unsubstantiated testimonies. All authorities had to go on in this case was witness statements, since they of course had no forensic evidence, and this disruption from some greedy members of the public hindered the investigation significantly. A witness named Betsy O'Reilly then came forward with some rather interesting information. According to her, she had seen Janet on the day she was killed, earlier in the day, speaking to an unidentified man who appeared to be quite poor and of a scruffy appearance. Because of this witness testimony, this male individual became the prime suspect in Janet's murder. The man was described as a slender individual, between the ages of 40 and 50, around 5 feet 9 inches tall, with a long face and brown hair. He was dressed in rather dirty attire, including a dark, frock-tailored coat, grey trousers and a cap. According to the handbills which were distributed around the area by police in an effort to find the suspect, the man didn't appear to work, but he also didn't appear to be transient. Despite questioning and arresting a number of people in regards to the brutal slaying, nobody was found guilty of Janet Rogers' murder. One man resembling the description was arrested in Burnt Island, but released without further charge. Another was arrested after being found to have blood on his hands, but the blood was actually from a sheep he had been slaughtering. 
Another suspect, a hatter named John Henderson, was arrested in Aberdeen, but after Betsy O'Reilly looked at him, she could not be sure that he was the man in question. However, the next day, she claimed it was the same man. Police eventually had Henderson's alibi confirmed to be that he was on a drunken night out on the night in question and concluded that Betsy may have just been eyeing up the £100 reward. Her description of the so-called man seen with Janet was now taken with a pinch of salt. The case caused a media storm and Janet's murder was strewn across a number of newspapers, even as far away as London. As a result, many false claims started to circulate regarding the killing. The media reports were getting out of hand because of this and nobody knew what to believe. It wasn't long, however, before the case went cold. Around 10 months or so after his sister's murder, William Henderson told police that he was suspicious about his now previous ploughman, James Crichton, who actually left his job at Mount Stewart Farm a short time after Janet Rogers was killed. Police also received a statement from another of William's previous servants who backed up this claim. It was shortly afterwards that police arrested James Crichton and charged him with murder. The trial, which took place in Spring Circuit, Perth, occurred over two days from the 9th of April 1867. The case against Crichton was poor to say the least. Many accusations were thrown about with witnesses claiming they had seen Crichton, who was known to be mentally challenged, dressed into two different sets of clothes on the day in question, some even apparently witnessing him bleaching his potentially blood-stained garments. Even though he claimed not to smoke a pipe, he apparently purchased a new one a short time after the murder. One was reportedly found in the kitchen where Janet was killed. Even one of the previous servants on the farm claimed that she overheard conversations between Crichton and his wife regarding the murder, his wife expressing her concern that her husband, quote, would be hanged for it, and that there was an exchange of money which looked like, quote, some of the silver taken from the farmhouse. There were some issues with this servant's testimony, however, as she actually waited several months to reveal this to authorities, but also police weren't sure about her intentions or character. Once again, the £100 reward may have played a part here as the servant in question, Christina Miller, was not by any means well off. Because of this, the jury weren't convinced of her story. The jury took only 12 minutes to decide their verdict, and for those who aren't aware of Scottish law, there are three possible verdict outcomes. Guilty, not guilty, and not proven. The verdict was delivered by the jury as not proven, and James Crichton was subsequently released. Janet's brother, William, struggled to come to terms with the loss of his sister, and as a result, moved away from the Mount Stewart farm. He was eventually committed to Murray's Royal Lunatic Asylum after he went insane trying to prove that James Crichton had killed his sister. He also continuously claimed to be poisoned and constantly spoke about Janet's murder, something which consumed him until his dying day. Even two years after he was released from the asylum, William still spoke about the murder. However, his mental health deteriorated once more, and as a result, he was readmitted to the asylum after a window-smashing spree. William died in 1890, 24 years after his sister Janet. To many, William Henderson is viewed as a secondary victim of this murder, simply because of the great distress it caused him in the aftermath, physically, emotionally, and mentally. Despite the years that have passed, nobody has ever been convicted of murdering Janet Rogers. The reason as to why anyone would want to kill Janet also remains a mystery. Was James Crichton involved? Was he perhaps wanting to settle a score he had with William, whom he disliked? Maybe Crichton was an admirer of Janet's, and upon her rejection of him, he lashed out. Perhaps the perpetrator was an unknown assailant who robbed the property and killed Janet as a means to silence her. Regardless, this case remains one of Scotland's oldest unsolved murder cases, and it is strongly likely that we will never get answers as to who brutally killed Janet Rogers.
Playa Giron is a coastal village in Cuba, situated along a picturesque beach surrounded by the Caribbean Sea. The sandy shores and stunning ocean views provide the perfect backdrop for both relaxation and enjoying the natural beauty of the island. In November 1999, Claudia von Weiss, a 35-year-old bank clerk originally from Dresden in Hamburg, Germany, and her husband, Miguel de Venegas, a Bolivian export clerk, chose to embark on a vacation to Playa Giron. With Miguel having resided in Germany for around 15 years and their marriage reaching its fourth anniversary, the couple opted for a two-week stay at the Siva Club Hotel. Nestled on the beach, the hotel complex boasted a backdrop of lush forestry and marshes. On November 20th, 1999, the seventh day of their vacation, Miguel opted to go sea diving, leaving Claudia at the hotel. While some reports mentioned a morning disagreement between the couple, the details remain undisclosed and unverified. In response, Claudia chose to embark on a rented bike ride outside the hotel premises, a ride which lasted approximately 20 minutes to an hour, accounts differ. Her attire included a white sweatshirt, green and yellow shorts, and red sneakers complemented by a brown leather backpack slung over her shoulders. Although the specific contents of the backpack are unclear, it is presumed that Claudia had around $500 with her. According to some reports, Claudia collected the backpack from the hotel after she briefly returned following her bike ride, returning it to the rental company. Interestingly, according to German media, after Claudia left the hotel, she walked along the path she had just ridden with her bike, but this time she was not alone. She was allegedly with a Greek man named Michalis, who was a tour guide. It's unclear why the pair were in each other's company, and unfortunately Michalis passed away before police managed to track him down and question him about their interactions. A witness shoveling sand saw Claudia walking along the pathway and noticed her flamboyant yellow floral shorts. Upon his return to the Siva Club Hotel, around 4.40pm, Claudia's husband found their room key hanging at the reception. Perplexed, he inquired with the management, who informed him that his wife had left the hotel on foot at around 11am and had not yet returned. Residents in the vicinity reported seeing Claudia strolling through the village around noon. As Claudia failed to return to the hotel, Miguel's concern grew, prompting him to contact the German embassy in Havana for assistance. However, instead of receiving help, Miguel found himself subjected to intense interrogation, enduring hours of questioning each day about his wife's mysterious disappearance. German media reporting on the incident at the time revealed that Miguel was placed under house arrest, with his phone being tapped. Law enforcement seemed convinced of his involvement in his wife's disappearance, even going so far as to suspect him of murder. Miguel described the experience as psychological torture, a sentiment echoed by Claudia's family, who vehemently rejected the notion that Miguel would harm her. Due to lack of evidence, Miguel was eventually permitted to leave Cuba and return home to Germany. However, this resolution did not come until January 2000, more than a month after the distressing events unfolded. Upon his return, Miguel resumed his routine, including going back to his place of work, but none of it felt right without Claudia. By this time, no trace of her had been found. After returning to Hamburg following the disappearance of his wife in 1999, Miguel left his home with Claudia unchanged. He told Welt German newspaper, Nothing is normal anymore. I continue to live, work, sleep, eat, but when I'm alone, the horrible thoughts come back. Was she kidnapped, raped, forced into prostitution, or even killed? These fears were echoed by her parents, Alexander and Christine, and her brother, Eckbert. 
As the case grew cold, Miguel and Claudia's parents persisted in their efforts to bring attention to Claudia's disappearance. They utilised demonstrations and sent postcards to the German embassy in Cuba, aiming to spread Claudia's story far and wide. Their goal was to exert additional pressure on authorities to intensify their efforts in uncovering the truth about what had happened to her. The last thing her loved ones wanted was for Claudia's case to fade into obscurity, relegated to gathering dust on an investigator's shelf. In November of 2000, a year after Claudia's disappearance, a blonde woman's body was discovered in Cuba. However, the authorities concluded that it was not Claudia von Weiss. The ordeal was emotionally taxing for Claudia's family, as they were unable to obtain any information about the identity of the Jane Doe. Despite persistent inquiries with investigators, responses were slow, turning what seemed like a potential avenue for closure and clarification into a frustrating dead end for her family. Cuban authorities and the German embassy in Havana initially handled Claudia's case, but it was later transferred to the Criminal Police Foreign Office in Hamburg, where Detective Chief Inspector Sven Bach took charge of the investigation. In the course of his inquiries, he received several photos of Claudia for use on missing persons posters. However, a significant breakthrough in the case came from one particular photograph. It captured Claudia in the green and yellow shorts she was last seen wearing, taken underwater with a disposable camera seized by police from Miguel, proving to be a pivotal piece of evidence. Despite following various leads over the years, a breakthrough came in 2013, when Bach's son, Stephen, who was also a police officer, and his cold case squad received a tip advising them to visit the central cemetery of Cardenas in northern Cuba, so they flew over from Hamburg. In 2016, Stephen Bach assumed the role of heading Hamburg's cold case unit, but in 2018, internal disputes with the Hamburg police force led to his replacement. This transition shifted what had been initially regarded as a potential homicide case back to the status of a missing persons case file, a disappointing regression in the investigation. Nevertheless, Claudia's parents, with the assistance of a lawyer, successfully advocated for the reinstatement of Sven Bach in the case. It was at the cemetery in Cuba that Bach and his officers met a local undertaker, identified as Juan, who told them that he had been responsible for burying an unidentified, blonde-haired, blue-eyed woman in late 1999 or early 2000. Through graveyard records, the burial plot was found, grave 3026. The gravedigger was sure he had buried Claudia, and what solidified his claims was that he distinctly remembered the woman wearing floral yellow and green shorts, exactly the same ones worn by Claudia when she vanished. Rather oddly, however, the meticulously well-kept grave record contained no mention of this unknown woman's burial. One question persists here. How did the gravedigger come to bear responsibility for burying the body? Did he stumble across her remains, or did someone report the decedent to him? If so, who and in what circumstances? These details are unclear. German authorities showed the undertaker a photo of Claudia, and he immediately told them, having recognised her blonde, middle-parted hair and bright floral shorts, 100% that's her. During one of their initial visits to Cuba, Bach and his team carried a dental diagram to compare with the skulls in the cemetery's Tower of the Dead, where the bones of the deceased are arranged following the decomposition process. However, Cuban authorities denied access, bringing the investigation to a standstill. The reason behind this obstruction remains unclear and veiled in mystery. The perplexing question arises, why hinder the potential identification of a missing woman? The identification could offer her family a semblance of closure they have been seeking. 
It cannot be asserted with 100% certainty that the woman buried in the graveyard at Cardenas in the north of Cuba is indeed Claudia von Weiss. Despite the gravedigger's conviction and assurances to Claudia's family, the lack of information on whether the woman's body was exhumed for DNA extraction or dental comparison introduces uncertainty. The circumstances surrounding her burial and the absence of conclusive identification methods leave room for doubt regarding the true identity of the blonde woman in the north of Cuba, especially considering Claudia vanished in the south. If the woman buried in the graveyard at Cardenas is indeed Claudia von Weiss, numerous questions persist without answers. The circumstances surrounding her grim fate, the events leading to her death, and the identity of the person responsible for taking her life remain unresolved. As of now, her killer has not been found or brought to justice, leaving a painful void in the quest for closure and accountability for Claudia's untimely demise. Kevin Block and Jordan Spendlove dedicated their Saturday afternoon on the 18th of February 1989 to rabbit hunting around the Earl of Stradbroke's estate in Wangford, located in North Suffolk, England, off the A12 road. As they were heading home, Kevin noticed what he initially believed to be a shop mannequin lying in a ditch. Curiosity led him to nudge it with his gun, only to discover the grim reality. It was a decomposing body of a woman. The initial hurdle faced by the police was determining the identity of the woman found in the ditch. The body had been subject to predation by wild animals, and her appearance did not correspond to any of the missing women in Suffolk. Consequently, the authorities widened their search efforts, and soon the body was identified as Jeanette Kempton, who had been missing for 16 days. On the morning of Thursday, February 2nd, 1989, Jeanette Kempton's day began in a routine manner, in the district of Brixton, located in South London. The 31-year-old woke up and engaged in conversation with her two teenage sons, bidding them farewell as they headed off to school. Jean, as she was known to friends and loved ones, resided in a home within Brixton's Myatt's Fields Council Estate, cohabiting with her sons and her ex-husband, Paul. Simultaneously, she had initiated a romantic involvement with Barry Coleman, a married man who was two decades her senior. On that fateful Thursday, the last day she was seen alive, Paul happened to have the day off from work. Together, Jeanette and Paul undertook several tasks, including a shopping excursion along Brixton Road. Their errands culminated at 12.30pm, when they arrived at their local establishment, the Loughborough Hotel, which Jeanette frequently visited with friends, who described her as the life of the party. The pub gradually filled with patrons, and Barry eventually joined the pair, Having received his redundancy pay, Barry loaned some money to Jeanette. Following this, Paul departed the pub, leaving Jeanette to continue her evening with Barry over drinks. Around 6pm, Jeanette and Barry made a visit to a nearby florist to collect a wreath adorned with red and white flowers for a friend's upcoming funeral, an event Jeanette intended to attend the following day. After returning to the Loughborough for another round, Jeanette expressed a desire to go to a different pub, while Barry, on the other hand, preferred to conclude the evening. The pair left the Loughborough at approximately 7.15pm. Subsequently, a witness had observed Jeanette, clearly inebriated, entering Barry's vehicle. Contrary to this account, Barry refuted the statement, asserting that Jeanette had consumed a substantial amount of alcohol throughout the afternoon and evening. In fact, she was reportedly in such an inebriated state that standing became a challenge. At the Loughborough Hotel, presently housing flats and an art gallery in the London district, Jeanette reportedly consumed an amount equivalent to 11 glasses of whiskey, which is akin to five and a half pints. 
Barry claimed to have extended an offer to drive Jeanette home, yet she declined the offer. Barry recounted that the final glimpse he had of Jeanette was her walking down the street towards another pub, clutching the wreath in her hand. She never made it to the pub. Kevin Block, one of the men who found Jeanette's body 16 days later, described the scene. Her top was open and there was a scratch across her chest. Her calves had been eaten away and the meat off her fingers and face too, but her eyeballs were still there. Many of her personal possessions were absent at the scene, including her coat, shoes, jewellery and purse. The funeral wreath was also missing. The pathologist who carried out the post-mortem identified a significant head injury, indicating that it likely occurred 48 hours before she was asphyxiated. This timeline suggested an act of violence shortly after she encountered her killer. The condition of her body further implied an extended period in the ditch, pointing to the conclusion that she was killed and disposed of within a few days of her initial disappearance. Unfortunately, the police were unsuccessful in locating the murder weapon. Further investigations revealed sightings of two suspicious vehicles. Between 2pm and 4pm on February 5th, a dark-hued rental van displaying a London phone number was observed making a turn onto Middle Barn Lane, a rural path in Wangford. The van had a lofty roof, absence of side windows and two smoked glass windows at the rear. On the morning of February 6th, an estate worker named Leslie Fairs encountered a white saloon car. In the vehicle, he noted two unfamiliar individuals, one of whom was a woman resembling Jeanette, and she was occupying the passenger seat. The witness told the Eastern Daily Press that he was 100% certain that the woman was Jeanette Kempton. At approximately 11.30am that same day, another resident reported hearing screams emanating from a location known as Church Farm, situated approximately 400 yards from where Jeanette's body was eventually found. Unfortunately, the screams were overshadowed by blaring music being played in the vicinity. Jeanette was not actually reported as a missing person for a week, despite having not turned up at her friend's funeral on the 3rd of February. Her ex-husband, Paul, initially was not concerned, as Jeanette would tend to go out and spend time with friends for potentially days at a time. Her current partner, Barry, visited her property on the 7th of February to collect the money he had lent her, however he was puzzled when it appeared that she was not home. The BBC programme Crime Watch aired an appeal in May of 1989, however this turned up next to no new information in relation to the case. One theory suggests that she might have voluntarily disappeared with an acquaintance or, in her intoxicated state, encountered a stranger and vanished with them. Muggings had occurred on the street where the Loughborough was located, however, on the day Jeanette vanished, no witnesses reported anything out of the ordinary. Many thought it was peculiar, however, that Jeanette's body was found 118 miles from her home, and police struggled to identify reasons for this. Over the course of the initial investigation, police gathered approximately 400 statements and over 3,500 inquiries were conducted. Police believed that the person responsible for the death of Jeanette was likely very familiar with the area where her body was found. The hunt was on for police to try and narrow their search for suspects. A man named Anthony Gilby became associated with the murder due to a peculiar arrest. He was under surveillance in a cubicle by police who were suspicious that he was taking some time, but also he had been wearing unusual attire. He was wearing stockings to help with circulation in his legs due to thrombosis, and as a precaution to make sure the stockings stayed secure, he wore a corset with straps beneath his clothes. He explained upon his arrest for gross indecency he had been recovering from surgery on his bladder, which meant he spent longer than the average person on the toilet. Authorities also charged him with the murder of Jeanette Kempton, however this charge was dropped the following day. In total, there were five individuals under suspicion. 
While the police never publicly disclosed their identities, both her ex-husband Paul and boyfriend Barry were interviewed by law enforcement before being excluded as suspects. Witnesses confirmed that Jeanette tended to have many lovers and occasionally police had been called about various incidents. Despite exploring many paths of investigation, police never gathered enough evidence to arrest or charge anybody in relation to Jeanette's death. Chris Clark, a former police officer specialising in cold cases, has drawn a connection between Jeanette's vanishing and the Suffolk serial killer Steve Wright. Clark emphasises that the perpetrator would need to be familiar with Suffolk to discreetly dispose of Jeanette's body in such an isolated location, all while having ties to South London. Steve Wright fulfills both criteria, as he was employed at a South London pub during Jeanette's disappearance, specifically the White Horse in Chislehurst, approximately 10 miles from Brixton. Moreover, he had previous residency in Suffolk and was acquainted with the A12 area. Wright's modus operandi also aligns with Jeanette's case, as evidenced by the killings of five prostitutes in Ipswich in 2006. Like Jeanette, his victims were vulnerable women whom he targeted, subsequently strangling and discarding their bodies in rivers or fields. Notably, he carried out these crimes while the victims were under the influence of substantial drug doses. Wright's ex-wife, Diane Cole, said in 2019 that she believes he was responsible for Jeanette's murder. There is no evidence, however, to back up this theory, therefore police haven't ventured down that path of inquiry. Upon examination of the case, an individual with close ties to Jeanette has been recognised as a person of interest. An examination of the forensic evidence has been conducted and the results are currently under analysis to guide the next steps in advancing the case. Andy Guy, the major crime review and unsolved case manager for Suffolk Police, mentioned that the case underwent reviews in 2009 and 2016 and suggested it would benefit from another comprehensive forensic examination. Anyone possessing information related to the homicide of Jeanette Kempton is urged to get in touch with the major investigations team at 01953 423 819. In the summer of 1980, an American student vanished without a trace. There were no signs of a struggle or disturbance, and not one single clue to indicate what had happened to her. Over 40 years later, her loved ones continued to search for answers to her mysterious disappearance. Anne Denise Victoria Manchester was born on the 10th of June 1954 in Delaware to Andrew and Joyce Manchester. In her early years, between 1961 and 1966, Anne lived with her parents in Walnut Creek, located within the San Francisco Bay Area of California, having also spent some of her childhood in Wilmington, Delaware. After living in California, the family then relocated and returned to their home state of Delaware, settling at number 18 Harlet Drive in Anglesey, which sat close to the now former Hercules Country Club by Lancaster Pike in Newcastle County. By late June of 1980, 26-year-old Anne, a graduate of Alexis I. DuPont High School, had moved out of the family home and lived in a third-floor apartment at the Villa Belmont apartment complex on Welsh Tract Road in Newark. She was a student at the University of Delaware and was in the final week of her studies, where she was set to graduate with a master's degree in business administration following a final exam on the 30th of June. Before she finalised her decision to pursue full-time education, Anne had served as a secretary at Claymont Steel Firm, but had resigned from her position several months prior. Anne's loved ones described her as a precise and orderly individual, leading a well-organised life. 
Her apartment was consistently immaculate, and she diligently recorded her appointments on a calendar. On the 9th of July, Anne's parents, Andrew and Joyce, returned home after a short holiday and planned to visit their daughter. The next day, they went to Villa Belmont and noticed that Anne's car, a light blue Honda, was still in the car park. Upon entering the apartment complex, they discovered that the front door to Anne's apartment was unlocked. The apartment was clean and undisturbed. However, it lay unsettlingly silent. Some of Anne's possessions were found, including her keys, purse, cigarettes and lighter, as well as her checkbook. In the kitchen, a pair of flip-flop sandals belonging to Anne had been placed beneath the dining table, with a stack of textbooks and a half-full glass of diet soda laying on the table. Upon closer inspection, a thin layer had formed over the liquid in the glass, suggesting it had sat untouched for quite some time. Andrew and Joyce were concerned that there was no sign of their daughter, and subsequently contacted police to report her as a missing person. Initial investigation revealed that Anne's last known movements were on Sunday the 29th of June, ten days before her parents returned from their vacation. Her vanishing rang alarm bells for many, because she was due to set her final exam the following day, however she did not turn up. On the 29th of June, Anne was visited by an unnamed male friend, who departed from the Villa Belmont complex at approximately 12.30pm. At 2pm, Anne called a female friend, and this was the last contact Anne engaged in before vanishing. Police interviewed these two individuals, with the male friend, who according to reports was not a student, recalling what Anne was wearing, specifically a t-shirt and cut-off blue jeans. Police stated he was very cooperative in their investigation. The female friend stated that she and Anne had talked about school during the phone call, and nothing seemed awry or out of the ordinary. Two weeks later, her parents offered a $1,000 reward for any information regarding Anne's out-of-character disappearance. Andrew Manchester, who was employed as an engineer at Hercules Inc., told the media that he believed his daughter had been kidnapped and she may have come to harm. Sergeant Alex von Koch, who was investigating this case, stated to the press we have spoken to her friends, acquaintances, classmates. There's no indication of instability. On the contrary. Continuing, Van Gogh further elaborated on Anne's relationships, saying that she had the usual boyfriends college girls have. However, there were no indications that Anne was in a serious relationship with anyone at the time of her disappearance. According to her family, she went on a couple of dates, however none had evolved into a serious relationship, at least to her family's knowledge. Anne's friends said that she would travel everywhere by car, and never went for a jog or cycled recreationally, and Anne's neighbours reported that nothing unusual had occurred in the apartment complex at the time Anne went missing. The sandals beneath the kitchen table led detectives to suspect that she left the apartment barefoot, however it is not a certainty. Despite extensive searches conducted by friends, family and law enforcement in the fields and residential areas surrounding Anne's apartment building, no clues were discovered. There seemed to be no signs of a struggle, and with the door being unlocked, it was thought that Anne had perhaps left her apartment momentarily, fully intending to return. Police distributed flyers around Delaware and the surrounding states, anticipating tips from the public regarding the case, however their hopes dwindled as time went on. There were many theories put forward in regards to Anne's fate. 
Approximately one year after Anne's disappearance, a local newspaper circulated a rumour suggesting that she had been murdered, placed in a suitcase and then discarded at the Claymont steel firm where she was formerly employed. However, law enforcement later clarified that there was no evidence to substantiate this rumour. Some thought that Anne had taken her own life, however her body was never found to ever confirm this theory. Anne's familial DNA was compared to three Jane Doe's. The first was the 1981 Hanover County Jane Doe, who had been in a serious car crash in Doswell, Virginia. Unfortunately, her head could not be retrieved among the remains, and additionally, no clothing was found, as it had been consumed by the fire that ensued from the accident. The second unidentified woman the DNA was compared to was the cheerleader in the trunk, a young woman who was found deceased in a footlocker in Frederick County, Maryland, in 1982. The third Jane Doe was Eklutna Annie, a young woman whose skeletal remains were found along a power line beside another deceased person in Eklutna, Alaska, in 1980. Anne Manchester was subsequently ruled out as being one of these Jane Doe's, however, as of 2024, these three women remain unidentified. At the time of her disappearance in the summer of 1980, Anne Manchester was 26 years old and Caucasian with a medium complexion, standing at 5 foot 2 or 5 foot 3 inches tall, with brown hair and brown eyes. She weighed approximately 110 to 115 pounds, was a smoker, and a police report indicated an ident mark or tattoo on left eyelid, which has also been described as a growth on her left eyelid. Despite it being believed she wasn't in any sort of relationship, she was last known to have been wearing a silver wedding ring a gold Timex watch, a t-shirt and cut-off blue jeans with a heart on the back. According to current police and media accounts, there is a growing belief that Anne's disappearance involves foul play, and investigators suspect she may have been either abducted or lured into a vehicle shortly after leaving her apartment for potentially a moment to do a task such as collecting her mail. If alive today, Anne would be 69 years old. If you have any information regarding the vanishing of Anne Manchester, you can contact the Newark Police Department at 302 366 7111. Correggio is a small town located in the Emilia-Romagna region of northern Italy. With a rich history dating back to Roman times, it is known for its historical and artistic significance. One of its most notable attractions is the Assumption of the Virgin Mary, a remarkable fresco painted by the renowned Renaissance artist Antonio da Correggio, after whom the town is named. This masterpiece can be found in the Cathedral of Correggio and is a prime example of the town's cultural heritage. Correggio, while not as widely recognised as some of Italy's larger cities, is a place where history, art and tradition come together to offer visitors a glimpse into the country's cultural and artistic past. The town is haunted by the murders of three women whose bodies were disposed of by the killer by making their remains into soap and tea cakes. Over 80 years have passed since the events, yet the crimes are still talked about to this day, the chilling story serving as a dark reminder of the depths of human depravity. Leonardo Cinciulli was born on the 18th of April 1894 in Montella, a small town in the province of Avellino in the Campania region of Italy. Leonardo, a notably superstitious woman, was raised in a wealthy family. However, growing up, she struggled with her demons, and on at least two occasions, she attempted to take her own life. 
In 1917, she married registry office clerk Raffaele Pansardi. However, her mother strongly disapproved of this union, as she wanted to arrange her daughter's marriage to a man of whom both she and her husband approved of. A pivotal moment in Leonardo's life, her mother cursed her marriage, and her venomous words endlessly echoed in Leonardo's mind. Feeling uneasy about her mother's words, Leonardo visited a fortune teller who prophesied that she would marry and have many children, however all of them would not live to adulthood. She also spoke with a palm reader who stated, In your right hand I see prison, and in your left a criminal asylum. In 1921, the couple relocated to Lauria Pontenza, the hometown of her husband, where Leonardo faced legal consequences and was incarcerated for fraud in 1927. Leonardo fell pregnant 17 times, however, she suffered three miscarriages. Of the 14 children she gave birth to, by 1930 only four had survived. That year, more plight plagued Leonardo, whose home was destroyed by the Arpina earthquake. The disaster claimed over 1,400 lives, left thousands injured, and over 100,000 people homeless. This was the catalyst for Leonardo and her family to move to Correggio, after they briefly took shelter in a home in Lariano. Leonardo was well liked in Correggio, and after so much loss in her life, she became very protective of her remaining children. In 1939, Giuseppe Pansardi, her eldest son, who was also her favourite child, signed up to the Italian army to fight for his country in the Second World War. Swimming in the depths of superstition and paranoia, Leonardo concluded that in order to keep her son and her three other children safe, prayers would not be enough, and she would have to claim four lives as an offering. Leonardo herself began to practice as a fortune teller, and was known around the neighbourhood to give readings to the locals. In 1939, Faustina Setti, aged 73, who was a lifelong spinster, was keen to find herself a husband, and Leonardo offered to help her. Reading cards, Leonardo told her that she could see a husband for Faustina in the near future. She told Faustina that there was a suitable husband in Pola, which is presently a part of Croatia and Slovenia, however at the time was a part of the Kingdom of Italy. Leonardo requested that Faustina should keep the news a secret from her loved ones, which she did. Excited about her future, Faustina brushed up on her appearance. She dyed her grey hair blonde and sold all of her possessions, plus her home. She returned to thank Leonardo before departing, however she had no idea that she was prey about to fall into a deadly trap. Leonardo offered her a glass, the pair toasting to the future. Leonardo watched on as Faustina swallowed the spiked concoction. The sedatives rendered the woman unconscious, leaving her defenceless against Leonardo Cinciulli. She sent postcards to Faustina's loved ones, who believed her still to be alive. However, the sinister reality was that Cinciulli had struck Faustina with a hatchet, then had subsequently dragged the body to her kitchen, where she removed all of the woman's clothes and cut her victim into nine pieces with a saw and knife. She then drained the blood into a basin, and once the blood coagulated, she decided to add it as an ingredient in homemade chocolate and tea cakes, which she then gifted to neighbours and locals alike. Both she and her son, Giuseppe, also consumed them. Within a large cauldron, there was over 30 litres of water, caustic soda and the remains of Faustina Setti, and despite neighbours noticing a peculiar odour coming from Cinciulli's home, nobody questioned the source. With no living relatives, Faustina was soon forgotten, and 30,000 lira which had been in her possession went into the pockets of Leonardo Cinciulli. 
Her second victim was 55-year-old widowed school teacher Francesca Suave. She was seeking work at another school and Leonardo offered to aid her in finding employment. She told Francesca that she had secured her a job at a school in Piacenza, much to her delight. It was on the 5th of September 1940 when Francesca visited Cinciulli for the last time, and just like her first kill, she managed to convince her victim to write letters and postcards for family before drugging her beverage and then fatally attacking her with a hatchet. With her remains, she made batches of soap and pastries, which were once again distributed around the locale. Once she slaughtered her second victim, Chinchuli managed to steal 2,000 lira from her. 53-year-old Virginia Cachopo, who was a soprano singer who allegedly performed at the Grand Opera House La Scala in Milan, became Leonardo's third victim. Virginia had dreamed of a happy life in the city, and Leonardo told her that she had managed to get Virginia a highly paid factory job in Florence. Leonardo told Virginia that she had been engaged in an affair with a member of the factory's hierarchy, which is how she managed to secure a secretarial job for her. Despite Leonardo insisting that the pair keep the conversation to themselves, Virginia did tell three friends about it, which would later be a decision which would result in the downfall of the infamous soap maker of Correggio. On the 30th of November 1940, Cinciulli murdered Virginia Cacioppo in the kitchen, the same way she had done previously. With the singer being of larger size than the average for a woman of that era, Chinchuli melted her remains and made lightly perfumed soap and candles. Following the murder, she received 35,000 lira, state bonds, cash and jewellery. Virginia's state bonds were cashed, and she also gave some of the jewellery away, which proved to be a grave mistake for Chinchuli, as all transactions would eventually be traced back to her. Suspicions also arose when she was spending an incredible amount of money, which contradicted with what locals knew of her living situation. Virginia's sister-in-law, Albertina Fanti, witnessed her entering Chinchuli's residence. However, after one hour and 40 minutes of surveillance, she never saw Virginia leave. Concerned, she approached the home and knocked on the door. She was greeted by Chinchuli. However, there was no indication that Virginia was alive and well in the property. Albertina's senses were overwhelmed by a vile smell coming from a large kettle on the stove, and once she departed, she travelled to the Reggio Emilia police station to inform them of her suspicions. Police were quick to respond and questioned Leonardo. She denied any involvement. However, there was a turn in the tide when police shifted their suspicions to her son, Giuseppe, who was involved in posting the letters and disposing of victims' bones in the river. The bones had been wrapped in paper, therefore it was assumed that Giuseppe didn't know what he was disposing of. Leonardo subsequently took full responsibility for the murders. Following this, police were convinced that her son had not been involved in the murders themselves, therefore he was declared an innocent man. Whilst in prison awaiting trial, she wrote a 700-page memoir named Confessions of an Embittered Life, where she described the murders in vivid and gruesome detail, as well as writing entries of recipes for the soap, cakes and pastries she made with the remains of the women. Before the memoir's completion, her son did not believe his mother was a murderess. However, the memoirs confirmed the truth. Authorities had been surprised that she had managed to kill and dispose of a body in less than two hours, and Leonardo decided to show them how it was possible. A group of police accompanied her to the Reggio Emilia morgue, where she expertly dissected a body into nine pieces in a shockingly short time of 12 minutes. 
The trial of Leonardo Cinciulli commenced in 1946, following the conclusion of the Second World War. Throughout, she showed no signs of remorse, and medical professionals were torn as to whether she was sane. Leonardo Cinciulli was found guilty of killing Faustina, Francesca and Virginia, and was sentenced to 30 years imprisonment, a life sentence in Italy, and with no official medical diagnosis being made due to the uncertainty between doctors, Leonardo was given an extra three years in a criminal asylum, eerily ringing true to the prophecy she had been given all those years ago. In Pozzuoli's Women's Criminal Asylum, Leonardo Cinciulli died on the 15th of October 1970, aged 76, from cerebral apoplexy. Her body was returned to her family, and since her death, plays and films have been made depicting her life and crimes. The weapons used in the murders and the pot where the victims were boiled were donated to the Criminology Museum in Rome, where they can still be seen today. Cinciulli's gruesome acts, driven by an obsession with superstition and a twisted sense of maternal love, have left an indelible mark on the annals of criminal history. Her story will forever stand as a grim testament to the darkest recesses of human nature, a stark reminder that evil can lurk even in the most unexpected places.